a one day jury selection. This is a very serious thing that people should take note of. If you contrast this with what's going on in Georgia right now, where they're taking extreme precaution in ensuring they have a fair and impartial trial, as opposed to what Judge Bruce Schroeder is doing in Kenosha, people may take alarm. So again, these are all good questions to ask, but I do believe the opening statements will set the scene for exactly how uh, both sides will play. Hmm. Uh, Peter, Judge Schrader does the does it in one day, gets the jury selection. It, you could argue that if there are stealth jurors, people that really wanted to get on, this would have been a jury that you could get on because you could answer a few questions in voir dire, but it wasn't the uh, analysis that, as Cannon pointed out, the prospective jurors are put under down in Georgia. Um, who would want to get on this trial, do you think? If there are stealth jurors, is it someone who wants to see Kyle free, free Kyle Rittenhouse, or is it a member of the community here that wants this outsider, this Illinoiser, to go down because he never should have been there in the first place? I think it could be either of those two um, potential jurors. Um, so, so somebody who really has a view and wants to make his or her point, um, and kind of wants to put him or self, himself or herself in the middle of, of, of this issue. Uh, I would hope that even though it was in fact one day that Judge Schroeder's directive and the way he runs his courtroom in conjunction with the prosecution and the defense would be able as best they can to vet those potential jurors out. Um, while never perfect, we understand that all the time, there has to be a little bit of faith in the, in the system. Easier said than done, I understand that completely, but that's what we have, and, and you have to hope that those people are vetted out. And we understand, according to our team in the courtroom, that Kyle Rittenhouse is in place at the defense table. The attorneys are in the courtroom just waiting on Judge Schrader and the jury uh, once uh, everybody's assembled. And, of course, as soon as the judge takes the bench, we'll get you in live any minute now. We are expecting to the beginning of this trial. Judge Schrader made an, an important ruling before in uh, pretrial motions that um, can a lot of people raised an eyebrow on. He says that the people that perished and the individual Gage Grosskreut that was injured will not be referred to as victims in his courtroom. Your thoughts on, on that and the fact that the defense can use uh, the descriptor of rioters um, when describing what was going on around Kyle Rittenhouse that evening. Well, Ted, to be truthful, as soon as I read that in the uh, news, the first thing that came to my mind was appeal. This seems to be an instruction that the judge should not have given. So I definitely do believe that this will be an appealable fact. Um, to say that the individuals can be called rioters but can't be called victims, I don't see how that doesn't persuade a jury to think more negative or um, not in a favorable light of the individuals who ended up subsequently dying from Mr. Rittenhouse. So again, in my mind, I think that this is something that the prosecution should definitely put to the side as something that they would use for an appeal. Peter, you're going to have something extraordinary play out in this case, and that is you're going to, the jurors are going to have video of what took place one of the deaths, uh, Joseph Rosenbaum, that video is, is grainy. It's very difficult to follow. But the other two, um, it's clear what is going on. Then you're going to have the defendant get up on the stand. His testimony has to mirror, does it not, what jurors perceive in the video from their standpoint if he tells a story that doesn't connect the same way as what they're seeing, they're not going to believe him. Absolutely. I, I think the video is 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 crucial in this case, uh, as it as is it in the other case. Um, that being said, once again, it is going to be incumbent upon both the prosecution and the defense to paint the picture around the video. Uh, I expect Kyle Rittenhouse to testify. 
I expect that he will try to assert what was in his mind at the time and why he did what he did. But it will, in fact, have to mirror what the video says uh, or what the video shows. I, I, I should correct myself. But it will have to mirror that. But this is going to boil down to who does a better job of filling in the gaps around that video, because the video is very telling. And Cannon, to that point, one of the individuals we'll hear from is Gage Grosskreut, who nearly had his arm blown off as he approached Kyle Rittenhouse. His testimony is going to be crucial, is it not, in terms of what he heard, saw, and his motivation for trying to, as he has said, get the gun away from this um, out-of-control teenager who had already discharged it several times. Well, I definitely believe that his testimony is crucial. Um, if you look at the jury breakdown, you have nine men and 11 women. It would definitely do the prosecution um, some, um, it would be positive for the prosecution to walk through exactly what he saw, exactly the emotions that he was going through, exactly what he uh, perceived what was going on at the time that of the incident. So I definitely do believe that his testimony will be crucial, just as the video will be. Joseph Rosenbaum from Arizona just uh, released uh, from the uh, from a hospital after attempting suicide before he was killed um, on that night. How much character assassination do you believe, Peter, we're going to hear in these openings from the defense towards the victims in this case? Um, and is that a fine line that they have to watch out for um, and be very careful while doing it? But on the other hand, they do want to characterize these others, these victims, that they're not allowed to use that word, um, they were the aggressors. It's, how do you expect it to be handled by the defense? Full throttle. Um, it, it, is, it is paramount to the self-defense argument. Uh, in, w instability in in the vic in the victim's mental health um it's paramount to show that kyle rittenhouse was in fact concerned for his well-being and safety if they are going to be successful in a self-defense argument i believe that they are going to have to go after the victims um with respect to the release uh from the men the 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 uh, the hospital and the, I think one of the other victims had a criminal record. That's what they are going to have to go after because it goes towards whether or not Kyle Rittenhouse was in fact concerned for his own safety. It's, it, it's an, an extremely important point for the defense. All right, we'll see that play out in just a matter of minutes. We're going to slip in a quick break here again. All the parties in the courtroom still waiting on the jury according of our team. When we come back, you'll hear the opening statements in the case against Kyle Rittenhouse. Stay with us.
Welcome back. The jury is not in the courtroom, but Judge Schrader is on the bench. They're discussing uh, some housekeeping um, issues. Let's get you in live. Uh, to actually uh, get the complaint dismissed. If they wish to present a case, if they wish to raise an affirmative defense, which is that uh, he was compliant under both of those uh, subsections, that, that if he had a uh, hunter safety permit or the a certificate of completion that the second part of that, uh, third part of that statute calls for, uh, they can do so. But until they do that, I don't see uh, why that should be in the jury instruction. We don't have the self-defense in the jury instruction because that's another affirmative defense and they should raise that. And if they raise that, which they certainly will attempt to do so, then it can be in the charges at the end um, or in the jury instructions at the end. So no, I, I don't believe that at this point there's any uh, basis to dismiss it. I do have a brief uh, that I could submit. I did not want to. I did not want to be untimely, but that does lay out uh, why we believe it's an affirmative defense um, and not uh, a subject for a motion to dismiss. In terms of uh, in terms of the curfew violation, we're wondering how we're going to do that because that would be a six-person jury, not a twelve-person jury. You don't think I can just. A 12-person jury to decide it? Well, it's a different standard of proof. Well, that is confusing. Anyway, uh, um, I can submit this brief and send it to the defense if the court would, would find it helpful, but it, it's an affirmative defense. I mean, it's, it's clearly what it is. Uh, I understand the defense may not want this to be addressed at trial and may not want the evidence in front of the jury, but um, we've met our probable cause. We've met our standard in the complaint. Uh, and it's been bound over, and now it's uh, it's up to the defense if they want to try and raise this affirmative defense. We disagree that being 17 in and of itself is raises an affirmative defense. The state believes he'd have to uh, present the certificate of completion uh, the, of a hunter safety permit as called for in the statute. Thank well, you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think what I'm going to do is. Uh, is refrain from giving any instruction on either count six or count seven and tell the jury that I'm not going to give them an instruction at this time on those. Um, and, um, well, I don't know if I, then that's probably not the best thing to do either because then they don't know what we're talking about. Um, well, uh, what's your reaction to the claim that it's an affirmative defense? It's not an affirmative defense. It for, for 16 and 17 year olds, it's not an affirmative defense. The, the information that I've provided to the court through the um, legislative history makes it clear it's an age of 16. I'd agree with that 100. But if you look at the Senate Bill 7 and the 1991 Act, in three different places, it tells you in plain language that it does not apply. Not for hunting purposes, it does not apply, period, to 16 and 17 year olds who possess firearms. That is, and I've provided that to the court both in the act and in the Senate bill, Judge, and in the legislature, uh, Legislative Reference Bureau information. Well, I'm, so, gonna, I'm, I'm going to give the instruction as I've stated it. Um, these, are edu these are educational, they don't get a written copy, and they're just so they know what we're talking about when we talk about these charges. And um, uh, at the close of the case, I can add the whatever language is necessary, if, assuming that the motion is denied, which uh, you shouldn't assume, but if the motion is denied, then I'll add the, the language that uh, clears, what, clears up what, what exactly the full scope of the charge is. But I don't think, um, I, I don't want to leave them uninstructed on the one hand, and I don't uh, want to uh, um, misinstruct them on the other, but no matter what it is, it is exceptional from the general language of the statute. Hey, Judge, I'm not going to uh, argue with you about it. I just it, it makes it a strict liability offense today. If you're under 18 and you have a gun, you're guilty. And I don't think that's what the law is. So uh, that's the problem that I have. Is it, the statute clearly lays out exceptions for that. And to just say he's under 18 and he had a gun, those are not in dispute, then he is 
the way the instruction reads, there is no affirmative defense, whether it is or not, there is no defense. No, unless he has the no. safety certificate. That's the last part of the statute. In Wisconsin, if you're under 16, you need to be accompanied by an adult to hunt, as long as you have hunter safety. If you're 16 and 17... That's how you read it. Not how we that's read. He reads it how, differently. That's how the DNR reads it. And that's, uh, how they, yeah. that's how they <laughs> say it. Yeah, okay. So in All 16 right. and 17-year-olds, you can hunt alone uh, with a hunter safety permit, which is what the last part of that statute calls yeah, for. Well. And that's being completely ignored uh, in Mr. Trofsky's argument. Okay. Um, I am going to... give uh, some very incomplete language to acquaint them with the fact that there's a charge on the information respecting the possession of a firearm and that I will instruct them concerning the elements of that offense at a later point. Okay. And the same thing uh, will happen with respect to the forfeiture action. So. Uh, any other uh, objections or uh, problems with the proposed instructions? Judge, I, or, did, yeah. I didn't see on count five that you, on one, two, three, and four, you put an accept or you give the self defense instruction in some level. I didn't see that for count five, however. Didn't um, I have a general um, instruction on self defense? W w you listed them specifically for the charges or for the counts? I did. That's, how I, that's what I saw. Boy, it was early this morning. Um, it says uh, counts one through five. Oh, no, that's not it. Um, you're right. Um, that sh let's see, count five is uh, uh, attempt to commit murder. Uh, that is uh, going to have the same self-instruction as the same self-defense instruction as count one, three, and four. Very good. I, I just wanted to make yeah, sure that... You were correct in your observation. Well, you tell me when you're ready, Judge. Okay, what else? One last issue, and that's um, the court has included, as it relates to, I think it's count three, Mr. McGinnis. Um, count two? Count two, um, I'm sorry, yeah, 820. During instruction 820 yeah. is, is mentioned in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I guess the language in there that I'm having, uh, maybe it's just me, difficulty kind of coming to some type of congruence with is, the first, the first full paragraph, uh, the last sentence says, the defendant does not have a privilege of self-defense as to Richie McGinnis. I don't know if you see, if you see that. Um, however, later on in the instruction, it says, if the defendant was acting in lawful self-defense, his conduct does not create an unreasonable risk to another. So I guess the concern I have is, one portion says he doesn't have uh, a privilege of self-defense. Then another portion of that same st uh, instruction says he does have the privilege. I, I, you know, I stumbled over the same language. Yeah. And what I ultimately decided was intended, and I think I might add correctly, intended by the instructions committee was that he does not have a privilege of self-defense as to the third person, but the fact that he was, if he was, in exercise of his privilege of self-defense is a factor for the jury to consider in determining whether his conduct was criminally reckless and also was a factor for them to consider in determining whether it was done with utter disregard for human life. That's how I read it. I, I certainly don't think I, uh, I would want to get, uh, you could put a law school test together on this, you know? But that's how I read it. Now tell me uh, where you think I'm an error. Well, I, I'm not saying you're an error. I'm saying that I think if he's in self-defense as it relates to Mr. Rosenbaum, according to this, according to 820, he then has 
a perfect self-defense. If the defendant was acting in self-defense, his conduct did not create an unreasonable risk to another. So, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let's give a situation where uh, I'm, I'm out on the street and somebody confronts me and there's a family of four little children right behind him and he, the other person, the other actor, uh, puts me in, I'm in fear of death from the assault by this individual. So I whip out a gun and I open fire and uh, I include in the, in the zone, the danger zone is not only the actor for whom I have a perfect self-defense, privilege of self-defense, but also the four children who are behind him. And I, I think the, what, this is how I reconciled that reading in my mind was that when the jury decides about the charges involving the four children, the jury is to consider whether I was acting in self-defense with respect to the bad actor. That's a consideration in determining whether my conduct was reckless with respect to those children and also whether it was um, to show utter disregard for human life. And the jury might reconcile that by saying, well, you should have tried to change positions so that your shot wouldn't uh, have the uh, children in the background. That, that's how I reconciled it. I did, but I agree with you, it's confusing. Because I read A20 to say that if, it, if, the first, if the bad actor in your situation, if yeah. you were acting in self-defense, the instruction says that you did not then create an unreasonable risk to another. It, so, it's what it says. So I don't think then. Well, why did they? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, so I guess what I'm saying is I don't think if it's self-defense on the bad actor in your scenario, then by that fact, according to 820, the, the instruction says your conduct did not create an unreasonable risk to another. So if we're talking about the children behind that bad actor, the statute says, or the instruction says then, if it's self-defense, it did not create an unreasonable risk. And then there's a period. So. Uh, well, why is it, does it say up above that the, um, In the second sentence, the fact that the law may allow the defendant to use force in self-defense as to Joseph Rosenbaum does not necessarily mean that recklessly endangering the safety of Richard McGinnis was lawful. I agree. That's what I, that's what you, what I said to no, you. No, what I, you're telling me is that the, uh, the fact that the law may allow the defendant, the fact that the law may allow Schrader to use force in self-defense as to the bad actor does not necessarily mean that recklessly endangering the safety of the children was lawful. Why is it? You're telling me there's an absolute privilege of self-defense, not only as to the bad actor, but also as to the children. Only if, according to 820, only if the, bad, only if the conduct against the bad actor was self-defense. That's what the bottom, that's the part I've read to the court. If the defendant was acting in lawful self-defense, his or her conduct did not create an unreasonable risk to another, period.
Uh, if you look at the comments from the instructions committee, um, and on page, uh, well, I don't know if you've got the pages there, but um, uh, the same way I have them, but at, near the end it says, For example, assume that a defendant is charged with causing reckless injury to the victim and raises the defense that he was acting in self-defense against someone else and thereby injured the victim. Criminal recklessness requires that the defendant's conduct created, quote, an unreasonable and substantial risk of death or great bodily harm, unquote. In considering whether the risk was unreasonable, the jury should consider the evidence that the defendant was acting in self-defense. So I th that's what I'm thinking. Is that what they mean is there is not a, what, what you're arguing, I think, becomes a perfect self-defense as to injury to others during the exercise of perfect self-defense. And I don't think that's the law. It maybe was what we once thought but I don't think it's the law now, and that the jury, when they approach the um, McGinnis case, looks at whether the defendant, if, even if exercising perfect self-defense with respect to Mr. Mr. Rosenbaum, that he doesn't have a self-defense as to Mr. McGinnis's endangerment but instead, the jury is told you consider, because, and, and, and I'm interrupting myself, because, because one of the things we tell the jury, and you've referred to it several times right here in our discussions in the last couple of weeks, one of the things the jury considers is what the defendant was doing, why he was doing it, how dangerous was the conduct. When they weigh those things with respect to the uh, count involving Mr. McGinnis, they consider, if they decide that it was perfect defense, self-defense as to Mr. Rosenbaum, then they consider that in deciding what the defendant was doing, why he was doing it, how dangerous was the conduct, and then they make their determination whether the fact that Mr. Uh, 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 Rittenhouse was uh, if they find that he was acting in self-defense, they um, uh, can weigh that in deciding whether or not he recklessly endangered the safety of Mr. McGinnis. That's how I read it. And that's how I'm going to say it. <laughs> um, now, uh, but I am going to, I'm going to try to skirt around those fifth, sixth and seventh counts because uh, we don't have an instruction for number seven, and um, and uh, number six uh, uh, is. Uh, I, I, I've had lots of statutory issues come up over the years, and this is the naughtiest. Uh, okay. Um, other than that, any problem with the instructions? Uh, nothing. <coughs> nothing else from me, Jim. State. No. Okay. Let's get the jury down. Uh, Your Honor, before you do that, um, Your Honor, I do want to put something on the record uh, with regard to the jury. Oh, yeah, I got something here, too. Yeah, what's up? Your Honor, uh, at the end of the proceedings last night, um, Brian Stute from our office came in to begin the process of setting up the audiovisual equipment and whatnot. Uh, while he was, uh, I think, entering the courtroom from the hallway, he passed by one of our jurors, and I'm going to identify this juror as juror 52. Um, I can say more uh, about that person's identity, but I don't want to do it openly in court. Um, my understanding is that uh, juror 52 recognized Mr. Stute, said something like, you know, hey, how you doing? Uh, like they knew each other, um, and I think Mr. Stute responded, you know, politely in response, and that was the extent of their interaction. Uh, Mr. Stude has explained uh, subsequently that uh, he had a previous employment where uh, he remembers Juror 52 from, um, and so that's the extent of their uh, prior uh, knowledge of one another. Um, so I wanted to lay that on the record uh, so that uh, everybody is aware of that. I did uh, tell counsel about that this morning before we went on the record as well. 
All right. Uh, any uh, question or observation? Judge, do you feel the need to ask her if that would have any impact on her ability to serve? I don't. Okay. It, you can ask if you you can ask me to ask her if you want me to, but I'll probably tell you no. Um, well, might as well be honest. Uh, it doesn't sound like anything, unless you have question about the accuracy of the re report to me. I, I think it's a non-issue. That's fine, Judge. We are uh, ready to go forward. Splendid. Okay, anything else? And I did get a note. Do you know uh, from whom this uh, came? Well, I don't know which one, though. Um, did you see them put a juror number on there? Only suppress the sound while I hold it down, or does it click on and off? Press. And then if I put, and now I'm live again, right? Okay. They, I've got the nice hand signals here from the respectful hand signals from the uh, court TV crowd. Uh, thank you. with your observation. All right, the judge is working out a um, note he received from a juror. Let's see if it tells us what it said. Okay, you know what? If you're just joining us, we're waiting for opening statements to begin uh, very soon. They're just waiting for the jury to come in, and the Judge Schrader first wants to figure out what he's going to do with this handwritten note from one of the jurors. Give them. Allowing the uh, attorneys and Kyle Rittenhouse to look at the note that was written in hand, uh, written out to the judge this morning, and uh, will likely uh, ask for their input. But again, we're expecting opening statements to begin at any moment. I'm guessing. Okay. Well, I guess too, but <laughs> okay. Um... Let's ask the lawyers to come up, please. Our first sidebar of the Kyle Rittenhouse case 
We still have uh, with us Cannon Kearney uh, is uh, still with us, along with Peter Stambleck, both in New York. Uh, housekeeping is always a part of uh, the beginning of a trial, and uh, now we've gotten some sort of note written by a jury, get everybody's input. Doesn't seem like it's a big deal, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, smiles around it. But things that need to be worked out, and these are the issues that are encountered in a lot of trials, especially high-profile trials. Peter, what, what if anything... Do you think this is uh, uh, going to uh, be anything? There was another incident with a juror that recognized a court employee. That was, that was my audio went off. All right. What we'll do here is uh, we'll take a quick break while they sort this out. And uh, actually, it looks like they're breaking up the sidebar. So let's stay here and see what the judge says. Make a copy of both sides and then uh, make it back up, please. All right. I'll wait long enough for that to happen. Sounds like they're going to make you know a copy of if some can, sort. Um, why don't we do this? We'll slip in a quick break, come back with the opening right. statement. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Court TV Live. Judge Schrader on the bench. The jury just walked into the courtroom. Let's listen. Right there in front of the officer there? Um, I don't care. We'll, we'll just have to move the chair. Yeah, well, that might... It, will he be able to see everything from there? That's my only concern. Okay, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right. Great. I'll talk more about the building later. And uh, that chair, when, when there's a break, we're going to move that out of there because I don't think I like it there. Um, yeah. Did you fill in the sandwich? I did. Yeah. Thank you. That can go to the. Thank you. Uh, and then one of these to. Those to uh, each side when uh, when there's a break or something. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, I'm glad I told you not to come in until uh, 9:40 uh, 9:45. Uh, I did tell you that, didn't I? Oh. Okay. All right. No, we were doing some legal stuff, and um, we're, we're that happens periodically throughout the trial, and it's uh, nothing exceptional. In fact, it usually ends up saving some time, some of your valuable time. And uh, so we hope uh, we, oh, I see how it's laid out. Okay. Um, we hope we won't have too much more of that today. Would you, uh, we're going to swear you now, your oath, to uh, reach a, f a fair and just verdict. So uh, if, if you would please, Can Mrs. Lehman. I ask Lehman. all the jurors to raise their hand, please, to take the second oath. Do you and each of you swear that you'll well and truly try the issue drawn between the state of Wisconsin plaintiff and Kyle Rittenhouse defendant, and unless discharged by the court, a true verdict give according to the evidence given in court? So help you God. And um, please uh, silence those phones if you would, uh, if you've got them on a on an audible signal. And. Um, before the trial begins, I want to give you some instructions which I hope will help you better understand your functions as jurors and how you should uh, conduct yourselves during the trial. Your duty will be, will be to decide the case solely as uh, uh, the evidence develops uh, presented at the trial and the law is given to you my, uh, in my instructions. Anything that you see or hear outside the courtroom is not evidence. Do not let any personal feelings about race, religion, national origin, sex, age, or politics affect your consideration of the evidence. Do not begin your deliberations and discussion of the case until all of the evidence has been presented and I have instructed you regarding our law. Do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else until your final deliberations in the jury room. There are times when I need to discuss legal matters with the attorneys that uh, do not necessarily concern you or in some cases uh, actually, uh, they, it's something needs to be discussed, uh, discussed outside your presence. And uh, you'll be excused at that time. Usually, if it's going to be short, I'll just put you into the conference room back here, which is, it might be a little bit tight, but I think you'll be okay. And um, otherwise, we may take a break and uh, you'll be up in your uh, jury room. When you're in the jury room, you need to stay there. Um, you can't be wandering the hallways. You can't be going, coming and going, except when you have permission from the bailiffs. And you do have, um, if you have permission from the bailiffs, you may go to the uh, uh, break room across the hall here where they've got some vending machines. Uh, and um, you can also go outside if you want to get a little fresh air or um, uh, smoke if that's what you want to do. Uh, the bailiffs will escort you, so you need to go as a group. <coughs> and um, uh, they know uh, the procedure, and then um, go back directly to the jury room and remain in the jury room until uh, you're dismissed for the day. Um, do not research any information that you personally think might be helpful to you in understanding the issues which are presented. Do not investigate this case on your own or visit the scene. Do not read any newspaper reports or listen to any news reports on radio or television about the trial. Do not consult dictionaries, computers, websites, or other reference material for additional information. Do not seek information regarding the public records of anyone involved in this case. 
Any information that you may obtain outside the courtroom could be misleading, inaccurate, or incomplete. Relying on this information is unfair because the parties would not have the opportunity to refute, explain, or correct it. Do not communicate with anyone about this trial or your experiences as jurors while you are serving on the jury. Do not use a computer, cell phone, or other electronic device with communication capabilities to share any information about the case. For example, do not communicate by blog, email, text message, Twitter, or in any other way on or off the computer. Do not permit anyone to communicate with you, and if anyone does so, despite your telling them not to, you should report that to me. It will be tempting when you uh, go home in the evening to discuss this with members of your household, but you must not do so. This case must be decided by you jurors based on the evidence presented in the courtroom. People who are not serving on the jury have not heard the evidence, and it is improper for them to influence your deliberations and decision in this case. After the trial has been completed, you are free to communicate with anyone in any manner. These rules are intended to ensure that you remain impartial throughout the trial. If any of you has reason to believe that another juror has violated these rules, you should report that to me. You are to decide this case solely on the evidence offered and received at this trial. Evidence is defined first as the sworn testimony of witnesses both on direct and cross-examination, regardless of the party who calls the witness. Second, any exhibits which are received, whether or not they accompany you to the jury room. Third, any facts which the lawyers, which the lawyers have agreed or stipulated or which I direct you to find. Attorneys for each side of the right and the duty to object to what they feel are improper questions asked of witnesses and to the receipt of other evidence which they believe is not properly admissible. You should not draw any conclusions from the fact that an objection is made. By allowing uh, testimony or other evidence to be received over objection, I am not indicating any opinion about the value of that evidence. You jurors are the sole judges of the believability of the witnesses and of the weight of the evidence. You, will, uh, you are not required to take notes during the giving of evidence in this case, uh, but you are welcome to do so if you wish. If you do decide to take notes, please take care that it does not distract you from carefully listening to and observing the witnesses. You may use your notes during your deliberations to refresh your recollections. Otherwise, you should keep them confidential. The bailiffs will supply you with the materials. You may rely upon, uh, excuse me, after the trial, your notes will be collected and they will be destroyed. You will not have a copy of the written transcript of the trial testimony available for use during your deliberations. You should therefore pay careful attention to all of the testimony because you must rely primarily upon your memory of the evidence and the testimony introduced during the trial. It is your duty as jurors to scrutinize and to weigh the testimony of the witnesses and to determine the effect of the evidence as a whole. <clears throat> you are the sole judges of the credibility, that is, the believability of the witnesses and of the weight to be given to their testimony. In determining the credibility of each witness and the weight you give to the testimony of each, you should consider these factors. Whether the witness has an interest or is disinterested in the outcome of this trial, the witness's conduct, appearance, and demeanor on the witness stand, the clarity or lack of clarity of the witness's recollections, the opportunity which the witness had to observe and to know the matters and things about which testimony is given, the reasonableness of the testimony, the witness's apparent intelligence, bias or prejudice, if any, prejudice if any is shown, possible motives to falsify, and all other facts and circumstances during the trial which tend either to support or to discredit the witness's testimony, and then give the testimony of each witness the weight you believe it is entitled to receive. There is no magical way for you to evaluate the testimony. Instead, you should use your common sense and your experiences in life. In your everyday lives, you determine for yourselves the reliability of statements which are made to you by others, and you should do the same thing here. The first count of the information in this case charges that on the uh, 25th of August of last year at the city of Kenosha in this county, the defendant recklessly caused the death of Joseph D. Rosenbaum under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life. 
First degree reckless homicide, as defined in the criminal code, is committed by one who recklessly causes the death of another human being under circumstances that show utter disregard for human life. Before you may find the defendant guilty of this crime, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following three elements of this crime were present. First, that the defendant caused the death of another. Cause means that the defendant's act was a substantial factor in producing the death. Second, that the defendant caused the death by criminally reckless conduct. Criminally reckless conduct means that the conduct created a risk of death or great bodily harm which uh, was unreasonable and substantial and that he was aware that his conduct created the unreasonable and substantial risk of death or great bodily harm. The circumstances of the defendant um, the third element is that the third circumstances of the defendant's conduct show utter disregard for human life. In determining whether the uh, defendant's conduct showed utter disregard for human life, consider these factors. What the defendant was doing, why he was engaged in that conduct, how dangerous the conduct was, how obvious was the danger, whether the conduct showed any regard for life, and all other facts and circumstances relating to the conduct. The second and third counts of the information respectively charge that at the same time and place the defendant recklessly endangered the safety of Richard McGinnis under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life. And the third count charges an identical crime involving an unknown male. Uh, and to each of these charges as well, the defendant has pleaded not guilty. Reckless endangerment of the first degree as charged in these counts is committed by one who recklessly endangers the safety of another human being under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life. Before you may find the defendant guilty of reckless endangerment of the first degree as to either of these counts, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following three elements were present. First, that the defendant reckless, excuse me, First, that the defendant endangered the safety of another human being. Second, that he endangered the safety of another by criminally reckless conduct. Again, criminally reckless conduct means that the conduct created a risk of death or great bodily harm to another person, and that the risk of death or great bodily harm was unreasonable and substantial, and that the defendant was aware that his conduct created the unreasonable and substantial risk of death or great bodily harm. A great bodily harm means injury which creates a substantial risk of death or which causes permanent, serious permanent disfigurement or which causes a permanent or protracted loss or impairment of the function of any bodily member or organ or other serious bodily injury. And the third element is that the circumstances of the defendant's conduct showed utter disregard for human life. Again, in determining whether the circumstances of the conduct show utter disregard for human life, you should consider what he was doing, why he was engaged in that conduct, the danger, that the, uh, the danger of the conduct, how obvious was the danger, whether the conduct showed any regard for life and all other circumstances relating to the conduct. The fourth count of the information charges that, the, that at the same time and place, the defendant intentionally caused the death of Anthony M. Huber with intent to kill him. First degree reckless homicide as defined in the criminal code is committed by one who causes the death of another human being with intent to kill that person or another. Before the defendant may be found guilty of intentional homicide of the first degree, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following two elements of this crime were present. First, that the defendant caused the death of another, and cause means that the defendant's act was a substantial factor in producing the death. And second, that the defendant acted with intent to kill another human being. Intent to kill means that the defendant had the mental purpose to take the life of another human being or was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being. While the law requires that the defendant acted with the intent to kill, 
It does not require that the intent have existed for any particular length of time before the act is committed. The act need not have been brooded over, considered, or reflected upon for a week, a day, an hour, or even for a minute. There need not have been any appreciable time between the formation of the intent and the act. The intent to kill may have been formed at any time before the act, including the instant before the act, and must have continued to exist at the time of the act. You cannot look into a person's mind to determine intent, which must be found, if, to, if it is to be found at all, from the defendant's acts, words, and statements, if any, and from all the facts and circumstances in this case which bear upon intent. Intent should not be confronted, excuse me, intent should not be confused with motive. While proof of motive is necessary to a conviction, proof of, excuse me, while proof of intent is necessary to conviction, proof of motive is not. Motive refers to a person's reason for doing something. While motive may be shown as a circumstance to aid in establishing the guilt of a defendant, the state is not required to prove motive on the part of the defendant in order to convict. Evidence of motive does not by itself establish guilt. You should give it the weight you believe it deserves under all of the circumstances. The fifth count of the information charges at the, at the same time and place at the city of Kenosha in this county. The defendant attempted to cause the death of Gage P. Grosskreutz with intent to kill that person. This is a charge of attempted intentional homicide of the first degree. The crime of attempted intentional homicide of the first degree, as defined in the criminal code, is committed by one who, with the intent to commit first degree intentional homicide, does acts towards the commission of that crime, which dem demonstrate unequivocally, under all of the circumstances, that he had formed the, uh, the intent and would have committed that crime except for the intervention of some other person or some other extraneous factor. Before you may find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following two elements of this crime were present. First, that the defendant intended to kill another human being. Intent to kill means that the defendant had the mental purpose to take the life of another human being or was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another. Second, that the defendant did acts towards the commission of the crime of intentional homicide of the first degree, which demonstrate unequivocally under all of the circumstances that he intended to kill and would have killed another except for the intervention of another person or some other extraneous factor. Unequivocally means that the Unequivocally means that no other inference or conclusion can reasonably and fairly be drawn from the defendant's acts under the circumstances. <coughs> Another person means anyone other than the defendant and may include the intended victim. An extraneous factor is something outside the knowledge of the defendant or outside of his control. While the law requires that the defendant had, had, have acted with the intent to kill, it does not require that the intent have existed for any particular length of time before the act is committed. The act need not have been brooded over, considered, or reflected upon for a week, a day, an hour, or even for a minute. <coughs> there need not have been any appreciable time between the formation of the intent and the act. The intent to kill may have been formed at any time before the act, including the instant before the act, and must have continued to exist at the time of the act. Again, you cannot look into a person's mind to determine intent, which must be found if found at all, from the defendant's acts, words, and statements, if any, and from all the facts and circumstances in this case, which bear upon intent. Intent should not be confused with motive. While proof of intent is necessary to conviction, proof of motive is not. Motive refers to a person's reason for doing something, and while motive may be shown as a circumstance to aid in establishing the guilt of a defendant, the state is not required to prove motive on the part of the defendant in order to obtain a conviction. Evidence of motive does not by itself establish guilt. You should give it the weight you believe it deserves under all the circumstances. The sixth count charges that at the same time and place, the defendant was a person under the age of 18 years 
and was armed with a dangerous weapon. The sixth, seventh count uh, charges that um, at the, at the same time and place, the defendant intentionally failed to comply with an order issued by an agent of the state or of a local government unit, which in, was engaged in emergency management activities under Chapter 323 of the statutes. Uh, the defendant has also pleaded not guilty with respect to each of those charges. I'm going to give you a more um, complete instruction about those offenses which are alleged uh, at the close of the trial. Basically, the sixth count deals with the circumstances under which it is lawful for a person who is under the age of 18 to have a firearm in his possession. And the seventh count deals with special circumstances in which uh, uh, emergency management uh, edicts are issued and uh, the requirements were, which are imposed for obedience to those edicts. <clears throat> The first five counts of the information allege not only that the defendant committed the crimes which are charged in those counts, but also that he did so while using a dangerous weapon. If you, the, if you find the defendant guilty on any of those counts, then you must answer the following question. Did the defendant commit the crime while using a dangerous weapon? Dangerous weapon means any firearm, whether loaded or unloaded, a firearm is a weapon which acts by the force of gunpowder. Before you can answer the question yes, if you are called upon to ask it, answer it, then you must be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the, that the defendant committed the crime while using a dangerous weapon. Self-defense is an issue in this case, and the law of self-defense allows a, the defendant to threaten or intentionally use force against another only if the defendant believed there was an actual or imminent unlawful interference with his own person and that he believed that the amount of force that the defendant and that he believed that the amount of force he used or threatened to use was necessary to prevent or terminate the interference and that his beliefs were reasonable. The defendant may intentionally use force which is intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm only if the defendant reasonably believed that the force used was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself. A belief may be reasonable even though it is mistaken. In determining whether the defendant's beliefs were reasonable, the standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in the defendant's position under the circumstances existing at the time of the alleged offense. The reasonableness of the defendant's beliefs must be determined from the standpoint of the defendant at the time of his acts and not from the standpoint, excuse me, and not from the viewpoint of the jury now. The state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act lawfully in self-defense. That is with respect to counts one, three, four, and five. So those are the charges of reckless endangerment, reckless homicide, and intentional homicide and intentional, uh, intentional um, atten attempted intentional homicide. Uh, a separate uh, instruction applies to, I'm sorry, I, I misstated that. The reckless, uh, the instruction I just gave you on self-defense applies to the first count of reckless homicide involving Joseph Rosenbaum the third count involving the unknown uh, male, the fourth count involving Anthony Huber, Huber, which is a charge of intentional homicide, and the fifth count, which is an attempted to, attempt to commit intentional homicide involving Gage Grosskreutz. There is a different rule applicable to the charge involving Richard McGinnis, the second count. Uh, and that is that there may be evidence in the case that the defendant was acting in self-defense as to Joseph Rosenbaum. The fact that the law may allow the defendant to have used force in self-defense as to Joseph Rosenbaum does not necessarily mean that recklessly endangering the safety of Richard McGinnis was lawful. You must consider 
the law of self-defense in determining whether the defendant's conduct as to Richard McGinnis was criminally reckless conduct, which showed utter disregard for human life. <clears throat> but he do, the defendant does not enjoy the privilege of self-defense as to Richard McGinnis, because Richard McGinnis was not in any way acting with aggression towards him. The law of self-defense allows the defendant to threaten or intentionally use force against another only if the defendant believed there was an actual or imminent unlawful interference with his own person and that he believed that the amount of force he used or threatened to use was necessary to prevent or terminate the interference and that his beliefs were reasonable. A defendant may intentionally use force which is likely intended or likely to kill um, or cause great bodily harm only if the defendant reasonably believed that the force used was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself. So that the, the, that self-defense would be applicable to the defendant with respect to Mr. Rosenbaum, if you find that it's sustained by the evidence. But that doesn't follow through with respect to Mr. McGinnis, who is in the area of the gunfire. And um, so you have to analyze that separately and determine, well, I'll, I'll get further into it. And keep in mind that a belief may be reasonable even though mistaken in determining whether the defendant's beliefs were reasonable. The standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in the defendant's position under the circumstances then existing. The reasonableness of the defendant's beliefs must be determined from the standpoint of the defendant at the time of his acts and not from the viewpoint of the jury now. You should consider the evidence relating to self-defense along with all of the other evidence in the case in deciding whether the defendant's conduct created an unreasonable risk of death or great bodily harm as to Richard McGinnis. If the defendant was acting lawfully in self-defense with respect to Mr. Rosenbaum, his conduct did not create an unreasonable risk to another. The burden is on the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act lawfully in self-defense. And you must be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt from all of the evidence in the case that the risk was unreasonable. You should consider the evidence relating to self-defense as to Mr. Rosenbaum in deciding whether the circumstances of the defendant's conduct with regard to Mr. McGinnis showed utter disregard for human life. The burden is on the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act lawfully in self-defense, and you must be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt from all of the evidence in this case that the circumstances of the defendant's conduct showed utter disregard for human life. In reaching your verdict, examine the evidence with the utmost care and caution. Act with judgment, reason, and prudence. The defendant is not required to prove his innocence. The law presumes every person charged with the commission of a crime to be innocent, and this presumption requires a finding of not guilty, unless in your deliberations you find that it is overcome by evidence, which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. The burden of establishing every fact necessary to constitute guilt is upon the state. Before you may return a verdict of guilty, the evidence must satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. If you can reconcile the evidence upon any reasonable hypothesis consistent with the innocence of the defendant, then you must do so and find him not guilty. The term reasonable doubt means a doubt based upon reason and common sense. It is a doubt for which a reason can be given, arising from a fair and rational consideration of the evidence or want of evidence. It means such a doubt as would cause a person of ordinary prudence to pause or hesitate when called upon to act in the most important affairs of life. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt which is based upon mere guesswork or speculation, a doubt which arises merely from sympathy or from fear to return a verdict of guilt is not a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt such as may be used to escape the responsibility of a decision. Examine the evidence and search for the truth, giving the defendant the benefit 
of every reasonable doubt. We're going to hear the opening statements of the lawyers now. <coughs> and we follow the uh, procedure where the uh, state speaks first. You know, sometimes you see these, these uh, actor judges, actress judges on TV, and they, um, they just destroy my enjoyment of the program when they tell the lawyers we're going to have the opening argument now. And I think, well, the only argument you're going to have is with me, because there's no such thing as an opening argument. It's opening statement. The argument is for the end, and that's when they're going to make their pleas to you to return verdicts in accordance with their beliefs. Um, at this point, they're going to briefly acquaint you with what um, they think the evidence is going to show, give you an overview, alert you to the things they especially want you to watch for in the uh, evidence. Uh, and they can be very useful to you for those purposes. Um, and, uh, and they're brief. Uh, and, and then we can write into the evidence right after that. Uh, Mr. Binger, I think, is going to address you first on behalf of the state. And then Mr. Richards will have the opportunity to make an opening statement now. Or if he prefers, he is entitled to reserve his opening statement to a later point in the trial. And uh, with that, um, again, uh, no note, well, you haven't got the papers yet anyway, but uh, no note-taking now because this is a discussion by the lawyer. Um, but uh, please give them your attention. And with that, Mr. Uh, Bigger, you may proceed. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The evidence in this case will show that on the night of August 25th, 2020, here in our community of Kenosha, the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse, who was 17 years old at the time, had armed himself with an AR-15 style semi-automatic rifle loaded with 30 rounds in the magazine. And using that rifle, he shot and killed Joseph Rosenbaum, an unarmed man. The shot that killed Mr. Rosenbaum was a shot to the back. This occurred after the defendant chased down Mr. Rosenbaum and confronted him while wielding that AR-15. The evidence will show that the defendant fled the scene of the dead body of Joseph Rosenbaum without stopping to offer any aid whatsoever. And as he's running, word spreads from the crowd on the street that there is an active shooter running through the area. And the citizens there attempt to stop him. They approach the defendant. They, one person hits him in the back of the head. One person takes a swing at him with a skateboard. That individual is Anthony Huber. Eventually, the defendant loses his balance and falls to the ground. An individual who is the subject of count number two, the unknown individual, runs in at that point and attempts to kick the defendant in the face while the defendant is on the ground. This unknown individual is unarmed. The defendant, in response, points his AR-15 directly at this individual as this individual is literally flying over his body and discharges that gun twice. Luckily, that individual was not hit. But clearly, if he had been hit, the wound would have been severe and perhaps even fatal. Immediately after that, Anthony Huber, who is holding a skateboard, comes in and reaches for the defendant's gun. He grabs hold of the gun and tries to pull it away from the defendant. The defendant is wearing his AR-15 strapped to his body. There is a nylon strap around his entire body and the gun is slung from that. So it is essentially attached to him. Mr. Huber's efforts are unsuccessful because of that strap. And in that struggle, the gun winds up pointed directly at Mr. Huber's chest. The defendant pulls the trigger one time and discharges a round into Mr. Huber's chest, killing him instantly. A final individual by the name of Gage Grosskreutz has followed this chase on foot and has approached the defendant at this time. Mr. Grosskreutz is holding his cell phone that he'd been using to record the night's events for a live stream on Facebook in one hand and a Glock semi-automatic pistol in the other hand. 
He runs up to the defendant. The defendant turns towards him with the AR-15. Mr. Grosskreutz raises his hand. The defendant then turns his rifle over, begins to examine it for a second. Mr. Grosskreutz takes this opportunity, and you will see in the photos and the videos, that he blades his body with his left hand reaching towards the defendant. His right arm is pulled back. This is the gun, one with the gun in his hand. And as he's reaching for the defendant, the defendant turns the AR-15 and discharges the eighth and final round into Mr. Grosskreutz's right arm, the arm with the gun. Mr. Grosskreutz runs off, screaming for a medic. The defendant gets up and walks away. On that night, he killed two unarmed people, shot at a third at very close range, and wounded Mr. Grosskreutz in the arm, who was armed with a gun. It is the state's position that this evidence demonstrates the criminal charges against the defendant, his intentional homicide of Anthony Huber, and his reckless conduct towards the other defendants. Now, what I've just given you is the snapshot, but there's a wider context here. As we all discussed yesterday, this occurs during the context of the events following the shooting of Jacob Blake, which occurred on Sunday night, August 23rd, 2020. And we all know that within a short period of time after that, the community erupted in protests, looting, rioting, arson, and violence. Sunday night and Monday night were two of the roughest nights that our community has ever seen. We are well aware of the damage that the uptown area along 22nd Avenue suffered. The probation and parole office on 60th Street, the furniture business there, car source, one of their locations on Sheridan, and other properties around town that were damaged. Fortunately, in the entire sequence of events, this was all property damage. And one of the things we all agreed on yesterday is life is more important than property. Up until Tuesday night, despite all of the things that the community had experienced, no one had been killed. But what happened as the time went on was that the people of Kenosha, who felt a sense of outrage, began to protest. But like moths to a flame, tourists from outside of our community were drawn to the chaos here in Kenosha. People from outside of Kenosha came in and contributed to that chaos. And it caused many of our citizens to fear for their safety, fear for their homes and their families, fear for their businesses, and take steps to protect themselves, whether it is to arm themselves, board up their windows, move or take time away from the community. All of those reactions were entirely understandable and reasonable. And no one here is going to tell you otherwise. As long as those are what you're left doing, there's no issue. But out of the hundreds of people that came to Kenosha during that week, the hundreds of people that were out on the streets that week, the evidence will show that the only person who killed anyone was the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. The evidence will show that hundreds of people were out on the street experiencing chaos and violence, and the only person who killed anyone was the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. We will show you videos of some of the events that night, of police, tear gas, rubber bullets, and yet the only person who killed anyone was the defendant. There are fireworks going off, which is a loud noise, sounds like gunfire. There are fire, guns being discharged, the sound of gunfire throughout our community that night. Hundreds of people are there experiencing this, and yet the only one who kills anyone is the defendant. We will show you video of hostile confrontation between literally hundreds of people on one side of the issue and on the other side of the issue. People getting up in each other's faces. And yet the only person who killed anyone is the defendant. 
hundreds of people experienced those nights, experienced the night of August 25th, experienced that chaos. Hundreds of people. And yet the only one who killed anyone is the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. Recently, I heard someone sort of tongue-in-cheek joke that jury service is bringing in folks from our community and paying them $8 a day to help solve a murder. We're not asking you to solve a mystery in this case. In most homicide cases, the elements that I need to prove might be a little challenging. But here, there's no doubt, there will be no dispute in this record that the defendant had that gun that night, shot eight bullets, four of them hit Joseph Rosenbaum, two of them at an unknown individual, one into Anthony Huber's chest, and one into Gage Grosskreutz's arm. That will not be in dispute. The central issue in this case is going to be self-defense. And the judge has given you an instruction, which I want to highlight here, because there are some factors that I'd like you to keep in mind when you hear the evidence in this case. The defendant used deadly force. There is a privilege under our laws to use deadly force, but it's a very limited privilege. That privilege, according to the law, indicates that the defendant can only use deadly force if he reasonably believed that the force was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself. In determining whether or not those beliefs were reasonable, the standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in the defendant's position under the circumstances that existed at the time of the offense. The reasonableness of the defendant's beliefs must, must be determined from the standpoint of the defendant at the time of his acts and not with the benefit of hindsight. You are essentially the people of ordinary intelligence and prudence who will apply that standard of reasonableness to the defendant's behavior and make a determination as to whether or not his use of deadly force was reasonable. Was it reasonable for the defendant to believe that the force was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself? So let's talk about the context of that evening. And I'm going to try and go in a little bit of chronological order to set things up for you so you understand the evidence as it comes in in this trial. The first witness you're going to hear from in this trial is a man by the name of Dominic Black. Dominic Black was, at the time of this uh, incident, dating Mackenzie Rittenhouse, who is the defendant's sister. And through Mackenzie, Dominic Black got to know the defendant. And they spent a lot of time together in the months leading up to August 25, 2020. In fact, on May 1st of 2020, Dominic Black bought the AR-15 for the defendant. That occurred up in Ladysmith, Wisconsin. Dominic Black used money that was given to him by the defendant to go to an Ace Hardware up in Ladysmith and buy the gun in Dominic Black's name. Now you might ask, why was it necessary for Dominic Black to do that? Why couldn't the defendant do that? Because the defendant was 17. And Dominic Black and the defendant knew that because the defendant is 17, he cannot purchase a gun. He cannot legally own a gun. And so this was, in effect, a straw purchase on behalf of Dominic Black, on behalf of the defendant. After the gun is purchased in Ladysmith, Dominic Black and the defendant spend a little time up there at Dominic Black's family's hunting property. And they fire both that AR-15 and one that Dominic Black already had. And the two of them are practicing using their AR-15s at a shooting range that they have on that property. And Mr. Black will tell you some more about that. Then they agreed that that gun would not go home with the defendant to his home in Antioch, Illinois. It would stay here in Kenosha at the residence of Dominic Black's stepfather in a locked gun case. And in fact, after the two of them returned from Ladysmith in early May of 2020, the gun stayed at that residence here in Kenosha until the day of August 25th, 2020. On the night leading up to August 25th, that Monday night, the defendant stayed over at Mr. Black's residence here in Kenosha. 
And the two of them decided on that next day, Tuesday, August 25th, that they would do something about what was going on in Kenosha. So at point, one point earlier in the day, they come down here. They work on cleaning up some graffiti on some buildings here downtown. Then they decide they want to come back later that night and protect a local business, a business called Car Source, which is located at 59th and Sheridan. Now, as I talked to you a little bit about yesterday, Car Source actually has three locations very close in this downtown area. One of them was on the east side of Sheridan Road, at 58th and Sheridan. And either on Sunday or Monday night, I think it was on Monday night, August 24th, that entire property was pretty much destroyed. There were multiple cars in the parking lot that were set fire and completely burned out. The building itself was damaged as well. Right across the street from there is another car source location that also sold used cars. And some of those cars had been damaged on the night of Monday, August 24th. So on Tuesday, when the defendant and Mr. Black are out and about, they encounter one of the owners of car source. And they talk to him about protecting their 59th Street location that night. And there's some discussion about that. In the afternoon, Mr. Black and the defendant go out to Jelinski's out on Highway 31, Green Bay Road and they acquire straps so that they can sling those guns around themselves when they come back to the downtown area that night. And eventually, later that evening, they return. They meet up with some other folks that are interested in protecting car source. Originally, they start out at 63rd Street Car Source, which is the third and final car source location. But then they agree, we're going to go to the 59th Street, 59th and Sheridan location, and protect that location to make sure no one damages the cars, no one damages the property. And I want to be clear, there's nothing wrong with that. Protecting that property is entirely lawful, totally understandable, and it's something that many people here in Kenosha did. And there's a group of people, including the defendant and Dominic Black, that take up positions at 59th Street. Some of them, like the defendant, are on the ground in the parking lot where as people are walking by on the street, they're having interactions with these people. Dominic Black will testify, he took up a position on the roof. He did that because he didn't want to be on the ground, close to where other folks were, close to where potential issues might arise. He wanted to stay a little bit removed from all of that. Didn't want to get directly involved in it. You will hear and see videos of sequence of events going on around Kenosha that night. The evening begins with large-scale protests, large-scale, um, no other way to put it, rioting that's occurring right outside these windows, right in front of the courthouse here at Civic Center Park. There is a crowd of police that have lined up to protect this building, to protect the public safety building, which is right next door. And there are a large number of protesters that are agitating. They are screaming at the police. They are throwing projectiles. Police are shooting rubber bullets, tear gas, etc. It is a very volatile situation at Civic Center Park. Now, that's at 56th and Sheridan, about three blocks north of the car source where the defendant was. But as the evening goes on, the police decide to move the line of protesters south on Sheridan. And eventually, they pass the car source at 59th and Sheridan. The police establish a line at 60th and Sheridan one block south. Now, as that process is going on, many of these protesters pass by the defendant and the people that he's with at 59th Street. Words are exchanged. There is confrontation. There is a little bit of hostility. No one is hurt. No one fires a gun. No one is injured. But clearly, there's antagonism. It is clear that this is a crowd that is not on the same side as the defendant that does not see him as an ally, does not see him and his group as someone that they identify with. And as I said, there is a hostile inter exchange there for a while. In fact, at one point, members of the crowd pull one of the dumpsters from the property out into the street and attempt to start it on fire. And some of the other folks that are there with the defendant go out and put the fire out and have some very harsh interactions with those people in the street. I believe the evidence will show that it is this process that demonstrated for the defendant that this is a crowd that is not a safe crowd to be in, 
This is a crowd that does not view him as an ally. This is a crowd that if he ventures out into it, there could be problems. Now, once the police pass by and the protesters are pushed down south of 60th, I believe the evidence will show that the car source that the defendant is stationed at is no longer in danger. There's no one there who's attempting to damage the property. There's no one there who's going to do anything to harm anyone there. The situation has moved on. Does the defendant stay there? Does he decide that he's done what he set out to do and it's time to go home? No. The evidence will show that the defendant another individual in the group by the name of Ryan Balch, who you will hear from, decide to venture out into the crowd. They cross the police line at 60th and Sheridan, and they walk amongst this group of hostile protesters. At some point, they both wind up at a gas station on the southeast corner of 60th and Sheridan called Ultimate Gas. And you'll see some video of the scene there. It is a scene, again, of groups of people that are clashing with one another verbally, that there's some shoving going on. And in the midst of this is Joseph Rosenbaum. And you will hear some testimony about Mr. Rosenbaum and his activities that night. Mr. Rosenbaum had been discharged from the hospital that very day and had come back to his home of Kenosha, had met up with his girlfriend, Carrie Ann Swart. He couldn't stay with her, so he left her and came downtown and got caught up in the midst of these protests. You will see him on videos. You will see photographs of him as he's walking around. He is carrying a plastic bag. Part of that plastic bag is clear and see-through. It has a string, white string, drawstring to it. It is the type of bag, I believe the evidence will show, that you get at the hospital when you're asked to put all of your personal possessions in a bag. Your shoes, your watch, your phone, your jewelry, etc. That's the type of bag it is. And I believe the evidence will show that he was carrying it around most of that evening. And at very, various points, the evidence will show that Mr. Rosenbaum is agitating. He is getting in people's faces. He is using obscenities. He is essentially daring people to respond. In fact, at ultimate gas, I believe the evidence will show that he actually gets right up in the face of armed people who are similarly armed as the defendant, who have similar AR-15 type rifles on. And he is literally confronting them in their faces. None of those folks shoot him. They push him away. He's five foot three, by the way, 150 pounds. They push him away. No one appears to take him as a serious danger. The defendant is at the ultimate gas station during part of this, so is Ryan Balch. I believe Mr. Balch will testify that there was an understanding that when we cross south of 60th, we stay together. We try not to intervene in anything. But if we get separated, head back to 59th Street, where our original group is. Mr. Balch does. The defendant attempts to. He comes up to the police line. They won't let him pass. He says, I work at that business, and points to 59th Street. And again, they won't let him directly through the line. Now, I believe the evidence will show that he could have easily gone a block in either direction if he really wanted to go back, but he turns away from the police line, returns to the ultimate gas station. And a few minutes later, we see him on the video of a man by the name of Corey Elijah, who will testify very shortly here in this trial. Mr. Corey Elijah was one of these people out on the streets who was Facebook live streaming the events of that night. And he catches the defendant passing right in front of him with a fire extinguisher. The gun still slung around his body, strapped to his body. And Corey Elijah will testify, this caught his attention. What? Where's he going with this fire extinguisher? And so Corey Elijah decides to follow with his video, recording the entire way. And we will show you that video. You will see that as Corey Elijah leaves the ultimate gas station at 60th and Sheridan and heads south, he passes by the defendant, who by this point is walking holding a fire extinguisher in his hand, all by himself. 
Poor Elijah, I don't think, registers that that's the person I originally saw. And he keeps on passing him. And as he continues, he passes by Joseph Rosenbaum, who at this point has taken his shirt off. He's got shorts on, and he's taken his shirt and kind of wrapped it around his head. And Mr. Rosenbaum is still carrying that plastic hospital bag and walking down Sheridan towards the 63rd Street car source. The defendant is behind him at some distance. As they get down to the 6200, into the 6300 block of Sheridan Road, that block on the west side of Sheridan has a house right at the corner of 62nd and Sheridan. And then on the south end of that block, the south half, is the car source lot. You will hear testimony from someone from the FBI who was up in a plane that night taking video. And we will show you the video. It is an infrared video, which means it picks up heat. This is at nighttime, so regular cameras, especially from an airplane, aren't going to be able to see everything. So the infrared helps us to see in the dark. The video picks up Mr. Rosenbaum. It is quite clear to see him because he is a white blob. Infrared picks up heat. He doesn't have his shirt on. So the cloth of a shirt would help conceal some of that heat, but when you don't have your shirt on, that heat radiates, and the infrared picks it up more clearly. So he's very easy to see in the video as a white dot. You see him running towards the 63rd car source. And behind him, running in the same direction, following him, is the defendant. As they get to the 63rd Street car source, there are some cars on the north side of that lot. Mr. Rosenbaum peels off behind those cars, and the defendant stops on the other side of those cars and turn to turns towards Mr. Rosenbaum. Now, obviously, in an infrared video from a plane overhead, we don't know exactly what was going on at that very moment. We don't know what words were said. But what's clear is whatever that confrontation that was initiated by the defendant started, it caused Mr. Rosenbaum to come around the cars and start running after the defendant. The defendant drops the fire extinguisher right there and runs, carrying his AR-15. At some point during that foot pursuit, the defendant turns around, points the gun at Mr. Rosenbaum, who puts his hands up in the air. Now remember, he has got no shirt on. He's got his hands up in the air, almost like, what are you going to do? The defendant stops, pointing at Mr. Rosenbaum, continues to run. And right around this time, there is a gunshot from someone else who we have identified by the name of Joshua Zeminski. This is an individual who's walking on the sidewalk, probably 30 feet away from where the defendant and Mr. Rosenbaum are running. Mr. Zeminski, for reasons only he can explain, decided to take his handgun and fire it one time in the air. As I said, this is in a different direction and many feet away from where the defendant was. Mr. Rosenbaum continues to pursue the defendant. And we will have Detective Martin Howard testify that he's timed the, the gap between Mr. Zeminski's shot and the eventual gunshots is about 2.5 or 2.6 seconds. Mr. Rosenbaum closes on the defendant. The defendant turns and fires four shots at Mr. Rosenbaum. You will hear the testimony from the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner, Dr. Douglas Kelly, that Mr. Rosenbaum suffered five wounds total from four bullets. Dr. Kelly will testify that the first two wounds that were inflicted upon Mr. Rosenbaum were to his lower extremities. We're not sure which order they were in, but one was to his right pelvis, fracturing his pelvis, and one was to his left lower thigh. Dr. Kelly will testify that these wounds caused Mr. Rosenbaum to start falling face forward. And you will see video of his body where it is found. He lands on his face, face down on the ground. As he is fallen, falling, the defendant fire, fires two more shots. One of them hits the defendant in the back, or I'm sorry, Mr. Rosenbaum in the back. And that is the shot that kills Mr. Rosenbaum, according to Dr. Kelly. You will hear testimony from someone by the name of Richie McGinnis. Richie McGinnis is a reporter who came to Kenosha to cover the events of that night. 
And at some point shortly before these shootings, he encounters the defendant at 59th Street and interviews him. He talks to the defendant and then follows the defendant down Sheridan Road and is right behind the defendant as these shootings are occurring. In fact, he is in the car source lot. He is behind Mr. Rosenbaum when Mr. Rosenbaum is shot. And Mr. McGinnis will testify that one of those rounds came close to him, which is the basis for the count that we've alleged that Mr. McGinnis was uh, recklessly uh, harmed or, or placed in danger by the defendant. Mr. McGinnis will testify that when he saw Joseph Rosenbaum shot All right, as you can see, the camera feed froze. We lost the audio as well. Clearly a technical difficulty uh, happening right now. The opening statement that was continuing, it appears this picture is back up. And there's the audio. Let's listen. They carry him across the street to Freighter South, formerly known as Kenosha Memorial Hospital, KMH, which happens to be right across the street. These folks load him into a hospital SUV that's there in the back of it and it races off towards the emergency room to try and save Mr. Rosenbaum's life. That's what Mr. McGinnis does. The defendant, after shooting Mr. Rosenbaum, gets on his phone, calls Dominic Black and says, I just shot somebody, and starts running away. Now, one of the things that you will see and hear in this case is that the defendant throughout this entire evening held himself out as an EMT, as a medic, that he's carrying a medical bag with him, strapped to his body. And yet in this time of Mr. Rosenbaum there on the ground, injured, Jason Lakowski. Jason Lakowski is similarly armed. He's a former towards the police. So the defendant starts running north on Sheridan. The crowd starts yelling, that guy, the defendant, just shot somebody, because that's all the knowledge they have at that point. And it's true. So they begin to chase after him. They clearly believe he's an active shooter, and they try and stop him. And I've already described to you the events that follow. Mr. Huber, the unknown individual, and Mr. Grosskreutz. So when we talk in this trial about the nights of August 25th, we need to keep in mind the context of that night. We need to keep in mind the fact that there were hundreds of people on the street that night experiencing the same chaos, the same loud noises, the same gunfire, the same arson, the same tear gas, the same hostile confrontations with people who believe the opposite of them. And yet, out of these hundreds of people, only one person killed anyone that night. Only one person shot anyone that night. When we consider the reasonableness of the defendant's actions, I ask you to keep that in mind. Now, in this trial, you are going to hear from a number of witnesses from the state. I've already told you about a few of them. We are going to begin the testimony with Dominic Black, and he will tell you a little bit about the acquisition of those guns. You will hear from Corey Elijah, who was live streaming the events that night. You will hear from Detective Martin Howard, who worked diligently to gather evidence, including many different videos, many different uh, photos of the scene that night. We are going to use that television to show you these things so that you can see them yourself. I know many of you alluded to the fact yesterday that you've watched or read things about this. You will get the full story here in the courtroom, and you will see some things that have not been made public yet. We intend to do that by moving the TV as central as we can so that you can see it as up close and as well as possible. And we will show you as much as we can about those night, about that, the events of that night. You will hear from the FBI individual who was in the plane 
taking that infrared video that shows the defendant chasing Mr. Rosenbaum and initiating that confrontation. You will hear from other individuals who took video that night. You will hear more about Joseph Rosenbaum from his girlfriend, Carrie Ann Swart. She will tell you about his hospital stay. She will tell you about that bag. She will tell you about what was in that bag. You will hear about Anthony Huber. You will hear that he was a skateboarder, that he lived for skateboarding, that he was at the skate park at Pinoya Park all the time, that he actually knew Jacob Blake personally, that he came out that night because A very good Tuesday afternoon to you, and thank you for being with us here on Court TV. I'm your midday host, Julie Grant. We have two major trials we are bringing you. They're being followed by people all across the country. Opening statements, we're just seeing the start of them in Wisconsin, where defendant Kyle Rittenhouse is on trial. He's, of course, accused of shooting three people, killing two of them. And in Brunswick, Georgia, today will likely be the day that they get a jury finally seated in the trial of the three men who are accused of murdering Ahmad Arbery. Now, we begin in Wisconsin, where uh, this case is just getting underway. And we saw yesterday the jury selection occurred. We know uh, 20 members of the jury were selected uh, to hear this case. And then we just saw the prosecution delivering their opening statement. The judge said, I'm going to give the jury a quick stretch break and uh, sent them out. Everybody in the gallery was standing up and then everyone will return to the courtroom and then the defense will deliver their opening statement. Uh, that jury composed of 12, pe 12 people, eight alternates hearing this case against defendant Kyle Rittenhouse, who is 18 now, 17 at the time this incident occurred. Let me bring in for some quick legal analysis Crim, uh, excuse me, criminal defense attorney Josh Schiffer standing by in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Josh, good afternoon. Good to see you. I know you saw the state's open. What did you think of it, please? You know, I thought the state did a really solid job by avoiding the theatrics, by playing down all of the exploitative nature of this crime. They're trying to make this into doing their job, prosecuting people who break the law, it's not a circus. It's not a show. They're going hand in hand with a judge that has a pretty, uh, you know, it, it, it's a justiciable and severe character because it's serious stuff that they're dealing with. Not that there can't be some levity. And I think that some of the judge's levity might be a little tone deaf, but certainly it's a professional courtroom. The state did not go break the bounds. They didn't run all over the place, do a big show. They prosecuted a case. We'll be seeing the defense now start up, and I wonder how they respond to that. A lot of defense lawyers would want to make a big show, really shake up the jury. The jury's tired. They've seen this. They want to grab a bunch of attention. Um, so we're going to see how the defense uh, handles the state's uh, presentation, because the initial presentation was strong. Josh, thank you. Let's take a look back at uh, some of that. This is at one point in the open where the prosecutor is talking about Cal Rittenhouse having that firearm, that AR-15, and that he was wielding it at one point. Take a look. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The evidence in this case will show that on the night of August 25th, 2020, here in our community of Kenosha, the defendant Kyle Rittenhouse, who was 17 years old at the time, had armed himself with an AR-15-style 
semi-automatic rifle loaded with 30 rounds in the magazine. And using that rifle, he shot and killed Joseph Rosenbaum, an unarmed man. The shot that killed Mr. Rosenbaum was a shot to the back. This occurred after the defendant chased down Mr. Rosenbaum and confronted him while wielding that AR-15. But out of the hundreds of people that came to Kenosha during that week, the hundreds of people that were out on the streets that week, the evidence will show that the only person who killed anyone was the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. The evidence will show that hundreds of people were out on the street experiencing chaos and violence, and the only person who killed anyone was the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. Okay, so that clip was the very start of the state's open, Josh, as you could see there. What did you think of how he chose to begin the open? You know, it, it almost begins right out of the textbook. Um, mm -hmm. Prosecutors are taught in advanced training and, and basic training, there are these different theories as to how to present a case. And then when you get to more advanced trial tactics, you start branching out. The state in this case has elected to tell a linear story. They've got some very strong anchor points, such as the fact that prior to Mr. Rittenhouse's actions, everybody was alive. And without Mr. Rittenhouse's actions, everybody would still be alive. And therefore, the problem is Mr. Rittenhouse. And Mr. Rittenhouse is obviously guilty. That is the line that the state's gonna stick through uh, this entire case, that absent Kyle Rittenhouse's choices, everybody would be alive. Now, the defense is clearly going forward with a self-defense action. That's going to be a burden that they carry. There's going to be a lot of testimony about the actions of the victims and the other people that were involved in this scene, specifically law enforcement, and what kind of mentality Mr. Rittenhouse was walking around the streets with while carrying a firearm in the middle of what's going to be described as a riot. Uh, that provides a lot of grace and room for reasonable doubt. It provides an enormous amount of discretion for any adult to protect themselves. And I feel the defense has some very strong points to make, regardless of the politics and optics of the situation at large. For Mr. Rittenhouse's individual actions, I feel that defense is going to put up a very strong justification that he was allowed to use deadly force when confronted with these quote unquote rioters. Josh, thank you for that. I, I want to take a moment to play another clip. Uh, this is where the prosecutor gave us an indication of who the first witness is, and it has a little bit of an interesting twist. Take a look. On May 1st of 2020, Dominic Black bought the AR-15 for the defendant. That occurred up in Ladysmith, Wisconsin. Dominic Black used money that was given to him by the defendant to go to an Ace Hardware up in Ladysmith and buy the gun in Dominic Black's name. Now you might ask, why was it necessary for Dominic Black to do that? Why couldn't the defendant do that? Because the defendant was 17. And Dominic Black and the defendant knew that because the defendant is 17, he cannot purchase a gun. He cannot legally own a gun. And so this was, in effect, a straw purchase on behalf of Dominic Black, on behalf of the defendant. Oh, so Dominic Black is going to be the first witness that the state calls here, Josh. We know that he's a friend of Kyle Rittenhouse's. Interesting choice. What do you think about it? Uh, a brilliant stroke by the state because the state knows Mr. Rittenhouse is going to say, hey, I'm just defending myself. I'm being attacked while trying to protect this community. And so the state needs to go in from the very beginning and show that when Kyle Rittenhouse showed up on the scene that night, he was looking for a fight. He was picking a confrontation, and that's going to lead to him being labeled as an aggressor. And once Kyle Rittenhouse is labeled effectively as an aggressor, the self-defense option falls to the side. And that's, that's a great stroke by the state. 
Josh Schiff, we're so glad to have you with us. Criminal defense attorney based in Atlanta, Georgia. He'll be on the program this afternoon giving us more analysis. We're going to squeeze in a break before the jury is back to hear the defense opening statement. Thank you for watching Court TV. And you will see video of his body where it is found. He lands on his face, face down on the ground. As he is fallen, falling, the defendant fired, fires two more shots. One of them hits the defendant in the back, or I'm sorry, Mr. Rosenbaum in the back. And that is the shot that kills Mr. Rosenbaum, according to Dr. Kelly. You are watching Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. We are bringing you gavel to gavel coverage of the case against Kyle Rittenhouse. He was 17 years old when he traveled from Illinois to Wisconsin uh, to insert himself into some protesting that was going on after the shooting of Jacob Blake. And if uh, in while some encounters were happening in, in the streets, we know that he has shot three different people. Two of them died. One of them is injured and will be a testifying witness. He and his defense team will claim that these were justifiable homicides done in self-defense. The prosecution is saying it was murder uh, that happened. And so we just heard the state wrap up the open, and that was one point that 
probably raised a lot of eyebrows because the point was made that one of these individuals was shot in the back. Now, a shot first in his lower extremities. So what exactly does this mean when it comes to a self-defense plea? Let me bring in for some analysis criminal defense attorney Josh Schiffer. So, Josh, I have to tell you, my ears perked up right away when, at first, when the prosecutor started telling the story earlier in the open, he said, and Joseph Rosenbaum was shot in the back. And I thought, oh, my goodness, how in the world is that self-defense? But then when you heard more, and he talked about how there were, there were five wounds, but four bullets, so only four shots, and the first two were to his lower extremities, his pelvis, and then one of his thighs. Um, then the next shots went to the back. Does that change things in your mind, please? It, it depends on how granularly they're going to go through the self-defense claim. It gives a lot of luxury to people to be able to pick apart something that happened in a matter of seconds using hours and hours of analysis and reviewing videos. Uh, when these decisions are being made, it's split second, and things happen faster than thoughts can process. Um, when the defense and the prosecution are going to pick this apart, each set is going to focus on individual choice points that justify their position. So for Kyle Rittenhouse, he's going to be able to provide evidence that these individuals were attacking him, that he had been told that they were rioters, that he was there with law enforcement protecting a community, and he's going to have all that patriotism behind him when he's going to testify that these individuals were assaulting, attacking him, and placing him under fear of immediate physical harm and injury. So he squeezed off multiple rounds, and the body position of his target changed during those round discharges, and that's why the bullet entry wounds are the way that they're going to be. And it's absolutely possible to have a back entry um, bullet wound with self-defense, just generally, it's not the first shot. It's going to be fascinating. It's going to be technical. And there's going to be disagreements the jury's going to have to sort out. Those conflicts in testimony and evidence compared to the videos and the limited stuff that the state's going to be able to put forward, the jury's going to have to decide what the truth really was. And that, that's hard. I agree, Josh. This jury does have a tough job to do. Would you say that it, it will probably come down to whether or not Joseph Rosenbaum was still a threat to Kyle Rittenhouse or was ever a threat to Kyle Rittenhouse? The reasonableness of the threat and how a threat evolves over time during an incident is going to be subject to a lot of speculation and analysis. The defense is going to provide that Kyle Rittenhouse was never given an opportunity to escape and that uh, the uh, assault that Mr. Rittenhouse was about to receive justifies him using his decision to discharge the firearm, and unfortunately, people were killed. The state's going to come back launching off of those first witnesses saying, Kyle Rittenhouse showed up to pick a fight. Kyle Rittenhouse went down there with the intent to support law enforcement and get into some, horrible to say it, good trouble on behalf of the state uh, and behalf of the community, protecting the community from these quote unquote rioters, who Kyle Rittenhouse is going to say that these people were shipped in. He's going to say and repeat all of the anti fascist, anti Antifa, all of the kind of right leaning political narrative that justifies taking your firearm and protecting your community. And that's, that's a, a, an effort. And, and a belief that a lot of jurors are probably going to understand. When your community is under attack, you get to go defend it. Um, the defense is going to put out that Kyle was doing what we are expected to do when our community is under threat, while as the state's going to come out and indicate that Kyle showed up with the intent to fight, uh, had an interest in illegally possessing a firearm, participating in this straw purchase in order to join a movement to protect the community from outside uh, rioters, uh, the Antifa, BLM, uh, or, uh, sorry, yeah, Black Lives Matter community. That's going to be central uh, to the state's case.
Sure is, Josh. Let's take a look at another clip from the state's opening statement to this jury. And this is where the prosecutor's talking about how after the first shooting, Kyle Rittenhouse got on the phone and called his friend and told him that he just shot someone. They carry him across the street to Freighter itself, formerly known as Kenosha Memorial Hospital, KMH, which happens to be right across the street. These folks load him into a hospital SUV that's there in the back of it, and it races off towards the emergency room to try and save Mr. Rosenbaum's life. That's what Mr. McGinnis does. The defendant, after shooting Mr. Rosenbaum, gets on his phone, calls Dominic Black and says, I just shot somebody, and starts running away. Now, one of the things that you will see and hear in this case is that the defendant throughout this entire evening held himself out as an EMT, as a medic, that he's carrying a medical bag with him, strapped to his body. Yeah, that's one of those tough facts to get around if you're on the defense side, Josh, and just want to relate to uh, we expect this to resume at any second because the judge is on the bench. A jury's still not in the box yet. Uh, Josh, what do you think about that fact, about Cal Rittenhouse putting himself out there to be a medic to help people injured during the rioting, but then when he injured someone, he didn't render aid? Uh, it really allows the state to comment at length about the fantasy life the Mr. Rittenhouse had created, um, and it feeds directly into the fact that Mr. Rittenhouse showed up to this riot or to this protest with plans to be involved and to find a role. And it, it makes him look like a liar. It makes him look like someone living a fantasy life right out of a video game. And that follows through, including uh, to the telephone call. Who shoots someone and then gets up into your channels and says, hey, look, I just shot someone. That, that's not the action of someone who's really concerned that they did something wrong or is putting a lot of concern on the life and well-being of people that they just shot. Uh, it's not compassionate, and it makes it seem that Mr. Rittenhouse is thoroughly disconnected with the seriousness of what he had just done. He had just participated in an armed battle for a community where he decided to start shooting people. Uh, that's a really tough set of facts for the defense to get around because it makes Mr. Rittenhouse appear to have a plan to get involved in some sort of confrontation that makes it seem like he was going out there with a lie on his mind. And therefore, how can you trust everything else he says? Uh, picking apart the integrity uh, and the veracity of Mr. Rittenhouse is part of the defense as well. Uh, this is going to continue down the path, and we'll, we'll see where it goes. Appreciate the analysis, Josh. And uh, we see the judge getting ready to bring the jury in. Um, and I, Let's I listen live. I think it's an unusual procedure. I've often considered using exhibits uh, in my opening statement, and uh, I think it's generally accepted that they're not evidence yet. So we can't, we can't be showing them to the jury unless they're in, in evidence. And, we don't have any of this in evidence yet, so I would object to that. Well, he doesn't need to tell you what he intends to show. No, I, I got to turn things on here. He does need to tell you what he proposes to show, and me too. <clears throat> but <clears throat> the rule does not preclude their use during opening statement at all. Um, and uh, what's up, Mr. Your Honor? First pit, the first slide is a jury instruction, part of self-defense. The second slide is a picture of Joseph Rosenbaum wearing the maroon shirt for identification purposes. The third is a video at the ultimate gas of Mr. Rosenbaum having to be restrained. The fourth is a still photograph of Mr. Rosenbaum walking down the street after arming himself with the chain. The fifth is a picture of Joseph Rosenbaum taken from the video at the ultimate gas station of him and Mr. Zeminski. The sixth photograph is once again a picture um, taken by Nathan DeBrun of Josh's win, excuse me, I said Joshua Zeminski and 
Joseph Rosenbaum starting a fire at the trailer. And in that one, Mr. Rosenbaum is wearing a blue mask. Number seven is a picture from the ultimate gas station taken from a video of somebody who's commonly been referred to in this as Yellow Pants Man. Kelly and Joshua Zeminski showing Joshua Zeminski armed with the weapon that was the first weapon fired at car source number three. Number eight is a picture for identification of Richie McGinnis. Number eight is a picture of how Richie McGinnis was dressed that evening so he can be identified in the videos. Number nine is Gage Grosquitz and his backpack taken from a video that has been agreed to be introduced into evidence. Number 10 is a still photograph of Gage Grosquitz running down Sheridan Road towards my client to arming himself. You can see him pulling the gun out of his back waistband. Number 11 is a still photograph of Anthony Huber holding his skateboard. And then number 12 is a picture of Anthony Huber holding his skateboard. So you can see the whole skateboard, but dressed the same way as it is in number 11. Number 13 is Anthony Huber holding Mr. Rosenbaum back at the confrontation at Ultimate. Number 14 is the photograph of Jump Kick Man, the non-complaining witness, kicking my client in the head. 15 are two close-up photographs taken from that of the shoes of Jump Kick Man. 16 is a photograph of 11.40 p.m. when Kyle Rittenhouse is going out with Mr. Balch and he's confronted by Yellow Pants Man and three other armed individuals that evening. And those photographs are blown up in 17, showing one individual with a noose, the other individual with rocks in each hand, and the other one a picture of the individual in the blue shirt arm. 18 is a video where Mr. Rittenhouse tried to return to the 59th Street car source and was stopped by law enforcement and the Bearcats. Number 19 is a still photograph taken from Mr. Rittenhouse at Ultimate as he's leaving with the fire extinguisher, his medical pack, and his gun heading towards car source three. 20 is the video, the what's called the infrared video with Kelly Zeminski, Joshua Zeminski, Rosenbaum, my client and Richie McGinnis circled and identified. 1148 is a still photograph of Mr. Zeminski's arm in the air firing the first weapon, the first shot. 22 is those individuals, that same photograph um, from the video, same video, a, a photo just a couple of seconds later with two circles, one identifying Mr. Rosenbaum in yellow and another one showing Mr. Zeminski with his arm raised firing. 23 is a video taken from, and I always forget this gentleman's name, Lucas, Lucas Zanin from 63rd Street, right west of Sheridan, which forms the south edge of Car Source, and that's what Kyle was running to. There's approximately 100 people there bashing all the car windows um, in there with pipes, bats, things like that, jumping on the cars. And you hear the first shot, which is Zeminski's, and people kind of stop a little bit. And then you see Kyle, you hear the next shot, and all of those people start taking off from car source. 24 is the video where Kyle begins leaving car source three after the shooting. And on that video, you hear somebody who has been identified as Kelly Zeminski yelling, get him, kill him, 
things like that. He just shot him. 25 is Gage Grosswitz's video where he runs up to Kyle. It's about five, seven seconds. Runs up to him as he's running down Sheridan. At that point, Mr. Grosswitz is unarmed. He asked Kyle what he did. Kyle said, I'm going to turn myself into the police. I had to. Photograph 26 is for BG on the screen. Photograph of an unidentified individual um, in a white sleeveless or what's commonly referred to as a wife beater shirt, hitting Mr. Rittenhouse in the head, knocking his cap off. And then right after that, you see the next photograph from that video of circled Mr. Huber picking up after a skateboard, which he had used to strike my client in the head. The next photograph is a still photograph of an individual running up to Kyle as he's on the ground. There are several individuals in that photograph. One of those individuals being jump kick man approaching from Kyle's right. And the next photograph is him kicking Kyle in the head. 30 is the picture of the close up of that and the shoes. 31 is a photograph of Mr. Huber striking Kyle Rittenhouse in the head with his skateboard held by the trucks in his right hand. Held what? The, the trucks of the skateboard. Uh, you know, did I look like I skateboard? Called, they're called trucks. <laughs> Okay, the wheels. They're, to okay. me, they're wheels. Fine. The wheels with his right hand while he's grabbing Kyle's gun, his bare hand, touching Kyle's gun with his left hand. The next photograph is depicting Jump Kick Man getting up from the ground. Mr. Huber with his hand once again on the gun going forward and still having his skateboard. 33 is a close-up of that photo. 34 is, you can see the strap on Mr. Rittenhouse's gun being pulled taut. Mr. Grosquitz running into the frame from the right of the frame. Next is Gage Grosquitz standing in front of Kyle Rittenhouse with his hands up. Kyle does not shoot. Next, Gage Grosquitz lunges forward with his right hand pointing directly and that is when the shot is fired. And then there's a picture of Kyle Rittenhouse on the ground, individuals approaching him, one with a pipe, one with his hands up. He backs them off, does not fire. 1151, him video trying to turn himself into the Kenosha Police Department and turned away. And the final is a photograph from the Antioch Police Department surveillance cam at 1.20 a.m of Mr. Rittenhouse and his mother turning himself into the Antioch Police Department. Mr. You know, I guess we don't need any witnesses. Well, we've got the whole trial there. I thought the opening statement was supposed to be a summary of the evidence, not the evidence itself. It, it, this, this is, uh, I think we're up to 41 videos and photos that are going to be uh, seemingly introduced through the testimony of attorney Mark Richards. This is a highly unusual procedure, Judge. Um, we will, both sides will have the opportunity to call witnesses to talk about these things. Um, we will have an opportunity in closing arguments to characterize these things, um, but to, to give the, the jury what the defense considers, and I'm not conceding that uh, these things are the all the evidence or even that a lot of these things are relevant, um, but for, for the opening statement to essentially be the entire defense case uh, and all the evidence showing it to them is highly unusual. Um, I took the approach in my opening statement, and I guess I was uh, not uh, pushing the envelope as far as I should have, uh, but it's always been my approach that I will uh, describe what I believe the evidence is going to be, uh, but I'm not the witness. I'm not 
uh, giving them the evidence. That's what the testimony is for. We've had a stipulation as to the authenticity of a lot of the things that counsel's talked about. That does not mean that they're admissible into evidence. It does not mean we're conceding relevance uh, to those things. And I anticipate that there will be some arguments as to the relevance of a lot of these things. We've already had some arguments about some of these things. Um, so, you know, you stressed to the jury that the opening statements would be brief. Uh, it took five minutes for him to list all of those things, let alone what it's going to take to actually show them and play them for the jury. Um, so I, I think as a general policy, Your Honor, and I understand it's not necessarily the law, um, but witnesses should be presenting evidence, not the attorneys in their opening statement. Um, so I, I object to this procedure. I think it's, uh, it's overly long. Um, it's duplicative of what the evidence is going to be. There will be an opportunity through witnesses to present all of that. I think counsel should be describing what he thinks the evidence is going to show. That's appropriate. Um, but showing them all the evidence this way, why do we even need witnesses at this point? Let's just, I'll get up and I'll play all the videos I want to play. They'll play all the videos they want to play and then we'll just be done without any testimony. That, that's not the way this trial should work. So I don't think this is a, a proper procedure, Your Honor, and I do object to it. Okay. Uh, well. First of all, are you going to be able to authenticate each and every one of these? All of these come from exhibits that have been agreed or stipulated to their authenticity. And uh, they're all going to be relevant? They all are relevant. Okay. They've all been... It, it, it sounded like what I've already heard about, uh, by and large. Um, you know, the standard is not what you did or what you can do or could do. Uh, the standard is what the law allows, and I can remember um, studying this 50 years ago that this was an acceptable way with judicial permission to make an opening statement. We see it more in civil cases than in criminal. It's, on, it's not cus customary in, in um, criminal cases, but I've seen it done by your office. Uh, so, And I have to say that you're right, this is a record number in terms of the numbers. But uh, on the other hand, there's record, there's a large number of crimes being charged and separate acts that uh, are being asserted with respect to both the acts that the state alleges were unlawful and the defendant's claim of self-defense. So um, given what th that they do appear all to be relevant and uh, they've been agreed as authentic, then um, I don't see any reason that I should interfere with his right to make an opening statement. Uh, Mr. Finger make a, makes a good point in reinforcing my comment that this is supposed to be brief and informative. So keep it. I don't it. think I'll be any longer than him, Your Honor. Bless you. All right. Anything else? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, one of the motions in limine I filed, uh, which was not objected to by the defense, is that there be no reference to any pending. Uh, or uh, prior criminal uh, cases or convictions with regard to Joseph Rosenbaum. Um, the parties are aware, the jury is not, uh, that there was at the time of his death a pending criminal case between Joseph Rosenbaum and his girlfriend, Carrie Ann Swart, and there was a bond condition that prohibited uh, Mr. Rosenbaum from having contact with her. The purpose of my motion in limine, which as I said earlier, was not objected to by the defense, was we're not going to talk about that. Now, I made a reference in my opening statement to the fact that Mr. Rosenbaum uh, saw Ms. Swart that night and was uh, basically was not allowed to stay with her or, or did, was not uh, able to stay with her that night, so he left her residence. And I purposely worded it that way, Your Honor, because there are many reasons why someone may not be able to stay at someone's residence. Um, it could be because of a bond condition. It could be for a myriad of other reasons. Uh, it's my understanding from an off-the-record discussion with counsel that he intends to go into this. He believes I've opened the door to it. I wanted a pretrial ruling from the court on this issue. We got one. And I'm now raising it because uh, if it's going to be mentioned in the opening statement, I think this is the time to address this issue rather than uh, in the middle of an opening statement. So I'm bringing it back up again. I do not believe that my statement opened the door to it. And frankly, my statement is not evidence. Um, so I don't know that it can really open the door anyway. But by and large, I was very careful in the way I worded that. And I don't think it opened the door. I don't think, regardless, this is a relevant issue uh, for this trial. Mr. Rosenbaum's con Conduct with regard to Ms. Swart has nothing to do with what was going on on the street that night. Um, so it is completely irrelevant, and I would ask that the court reaffirm its prior ruling on my motion to eliminate. Your Honor, he can't have it both ways. 
both ways he can't go and say he was at the house and he couldn't stay there and not why can't we tell the jury why because there was a no contact or it's not appropriate he thinks he didn't open the door but he danced through the door and he also talked about the hospital got out of the hospital he was in a mental hospital and he's going to put her on the witness stand and we're not going to get to ask that that's insane. I was very careful about the word hospital, Your Honor. Um, I believe it was actually St. Luke's in Racine, um, which is a medical facility. It is not a mental institution. This wasn't Mendota or Winnebago or something along those lines. Um, and uh, frankly, I'm not even 100% certain why he chose to check himself in. But again, it, it, whether or not Mr. Rosenbaum needed uh, a new kidney or needed medications for mental illness or was going to have his blood pressure checked. Has nothing to do with the, the events of this night. And frankly, it's just a backdoor way of attacking his character and suggesting to this jury that somehow because there's going to be an allegation from the defense that he had some sort of mental illness that, that had something to do with his behavior that night. I'd love to hear an expert on that, I guess, if they want to try and present that. And we can, we can go down that line and we can talk about whether mental illness contributed to his behavior. What was his diagnosis? What medications were he on? We could open that door and go all the way through it, but that's a mini trial on an irrelevant issue. And I, if it's going to come in, there's an, a way to get it in through an other acts motion, which was never filed by the defense. And I certainly have not opened the door when I talk about the word hospital. This could be COVID treatment. It could be a kidney transfer. It could be anything. It does not open the door. And again, I was very careful in the way I worded that, Your Honor. You know, if I start talking about his medications or I start talking about, you know, seeing a psychiatrist or something like that, that's different. Hospital is a very uh, nebulous term that could mean a myriad of things. You know, help me out here. Uh, I thought when I read the pretrial motions, and I know there were a series of them on which there was agreement, so I probably uh, may not have the best recall of those because I didn't have to put too much thought into it. But uh, I thought that the references or the statements which were attributed to um, Mr. Rosenbaum were, I just got out of jail today. Uh, you're telling me that he was, uh, there was also a discussion about hospital no. no, or there, there's what, there's no on? video or statements or audio of Mr. Rosenbaum talking about the hospital. The only relevance it has, Your Honor. Well, wait a minute. Let me. So sure. It was there is there is is there testimonial? Uh, are we going to hear testimony that he made statements that he had just gotten out of jail that day? There's going to be statements to that effect. Okay. My and in fact, your statement on your on your um, uh, opening statement was. And, and I will tell you this, I want to, I'm going to ask you to try to reconstruct from your, if necessary, I'll have the reporter read it. But I don't, I, I don't recall the exact statement. I do know that I thought at the time, I'm surprised he's going into this because it may trigger a response. So let's, what, what exactly did you tell the jury? What I said, Your Honor, is that, the, that Mr. Rosenbaum had gotten out of the hospital that day right. and was carrying around a plastic bag, right. which is the kind of bag that hospitals give you to carry around your personal okay. belongings. Okay. The only relevance that has to this case well, is that the I just bag. Wanted to get, I just wanted to get sure. a statement. Yeah, and, and I, now, I was doing that because okay. the bag comes in, and okay. that's, that's the only I understand. relevance. Okay, now, and you also made a statement about his being with uh, the person by whom he was allegedly bound not to have contact. That's true. And do we know the exact scope of that order? I I believe it was a straight, typical uh, no, don't no contract. Don't typical. No, no, no. We can look it up, Your Honor. Yeah, you, yeah. Well, uh, what did you say condition. about it? What did you say about it? What I said is that he had seen her after he got out of the hospital, right. that he couldn't stay with her, and so then he left and essentially came downtown. And Ms. Swart will testify. And Why she will talk. Why did you say that he couldn't stay with her? I'm sorry? Why did you say that he couldn't stay with her? I said that because it explains why he didn't, why he left and came downtown. He's got a hospital bag, Your Honor. There's, it's a little unusual, I think, for someone to be released from a hospital, have a bag of their personal belongings, go to their girlfriend's place, and then continue to walk around with it. Um, that's that's a little unusual. We know what was really going on. And by the way, how do we know that 
he had been there and had left. Is she going to testify? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so she's going to talk about seeing him. She's going to talk about that bag, and she's going to say she saw what was in that bag. And this comes into play, Your Honor, because this is the bag that was thrown at the defendant. There's been some allegations out there that this is a Molotov cocktail, or it's got chemicals in it, or some. It's got something that could cause the defendant harm. It had toothpaste, okay. mouthwash, a water bottle Here. in it. That's 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 the narrow relevance of this bag. Well, that's why I'm the not hospital. Concerned. I, the relevance is not something I want to talk about now. I want to talk about what you said and sure. why he thinks it is worthy of response. He's misrepresenting the facts of the case to the jury by saying hospital when it was a mental hospital. Mr. Binger knows full well. Why isn't that a hospital? We, he'd gotten out for a suicide attempt. So? And he, it's a hospital. He, and let the jury know what type of hospital it was. Why he was acting the way he was. He was not acting appropriately. That's part of the defense. And, Boy, and I, then he goes and says can't stay there. Why can't he stay there? Because there's a court order that says he can't. He wasn't supposed to go there in the first part. And if he was on trial for violating his bond, then we'd have that trial. But he hasn't been tried or convicted of that because he's deceased. But, Your Honor, the, and by the way, we have the bond condition here. It's no contact, including the residence, electronic or third party, with Carrie Ann Swart and the Park Ridge Inn, which she uh, stays there, and they had been staying there together until that criminal case started. So, you know, if, if we want to charge Mr. Rosenbaum with violating his bond, uh, what good would it do? He's deceased. But yes, that is true. But again, no. it, it doesn't make him a criminal on this evening. It doesn't make his behavior okay. help explain uh, any of that I'm, stuff. Uh, I don't think as far as your opening statement, you need to respond to his statement about the hospital. I'll have to separately decide Understood. at a later point as to whether the, whether he had been hospitalized and for what. I don't know if that's admissible or not. I suspect that it is not, but I'll keep an open mind. Uh, and. Um, as far as here is, is not being there or not supposed to be there, again, I'm, I'm not sure that I want to hear about that in your opening statement. Uh, but um, uh, again, I'll hear you later as to why you think that would be relevant. It just because he's talking about my client traveling here from out of bounds, right. and he's trying to say, oh, he had a good excuse for not being at home. He couldn't stay there that night. Well. Jury should know why he couldn't stay there. Well, I don't know. If he can't stay there, he can't stay there. She could have kicked him out because it, she didn't like uh, uh, his having a hospital bag. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure it's necessarily relevant. Uh, he was where he, uh, like, like the defendant, was not supposed to be, allegedly. And uh, we'll let the play out. But don't talk about those two things in your opening statement. Anything else? No. Okay. Would you come down, please? Yes. Okay. All right, you see everybody on their feet as the members of the jury will be brought back into the box. And just want to mention a couple things coming from our field team. Of course, these are our Court TV cameras in the courtroom broadcasting this case. Our team is there. Uh, we'll be inside the courtroom and outside providing reporting. And I just got a note from one of our field producers, Joy Lim Nakrin. Uh, you see her on the air from time to time as well doing crime and justice reporting. And she said that in the, fam in the, in the gallery, um, when it comes to the family members, now only four uh, per individual. So for Cal Rittenhouse, we understand there are three people there right now, his mother, one of his sisters, and a family friend. And uh, the Rosenbaums and the Huber families uh, are permitted to be there, uh, again, four per um, individual, but uh, they are not at this juncture. And Joy spoke to that head prosecutor, Thomas Binger, who said he does not expect 
the Rosenbaums or the Huber families to be here. And so not sure if that's just for today or for um, throughout the duration of the trial. We'll continue to provide you updates, but just wanted to share that with you now. With respect to the judge's ruling, and this judge very, very thoughtful uh, to reserve ruling on how the defense wants to portray uh, Joseph Rosenbaum and what they're able to let this jury know about the night before the incident that he was in a mental hospital after a, a suicide attempt and had just gotten out and there was a no contact order at his residence. That's why he couldn't be there staying and he was out uh, we know where. Defense once that in, the judge isn't sure it's relevance uh, at this juncture. He's going to take it under advisement. Um, when you're dealing with, what do we got, five, six lawyers in the room? What do you expect? All right, let's uh, go, Mr. Uh, Richards. May it please the court, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good morning still for the next 10 minutes. This is my opportunity to tell you and show you what I believe the evidence will show. You've heard the state's opening statement, and now I will give mine. We have two very different outlooks on the events of August 25th of 2020. Kyle Rittenhouse was present in Kenosha, Wisconsin on the evening of August 24th. He stayed at his friend's residence, Dominic Black. He saw on the live streams and things like that, the events of the 24th. He saw a car source, number one as I refer to it, the one that's on the east side of Sheridan Road, burn all of the automobiles, burn, destroyed. He saw the looting going on, he saw the other businesses burnt down and the next morning he went down to downtown Kenosha to look at the damage. He stopped and he helped clean up at the old Ruther High School. I think it's called something else now but when I was around here it was called Ruther and before that Bradford. And he saw that, he met one of the owners from Car Source and they talked and they decided that they would offer their services, him and Dominic Black and Nick Smith, to help protect the property of Car Source. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will show, in spite of what the media and public statements and things like that have been, the evidence will show that Kyle Rittenhouse had strong ties to Kenosha. His father lived in Kenosha, his mother lived in Antioch, Illinois, Kyle worked here in Kenosha County at the Recplex in Pleasant Prairie as a lifeguard. He went downtown to clean up the graffiti. Him and Nick left there, and they decided to come back that evening and help Car Source Lot 2, which is at 59th and Sheridan, and initially Car Source 3 at 60th and Sheridan. And when they were Doing that, they met other individuals who had come to town at the urging of websites and things like that, and then just a general, I would say, distaste for the destruction. And those guys from the West Bend area, Ryan Balch, Lakowski, Joanne Fiedler, agreed that they would all help protect the car source lots. And initially, they went to the lot at 59th early in the evening. And what will end up being, you will see the events of that night unfold in video and still photographs. But ultimately, what this case will come down to, it isn't a who done it, when did it happen, or anything like that. It is, was Kyle Rittenhouse's actions privileged under the law of self-defense. That is, that the defendant believed that there was an actual or imminent unlawful interference with his person. The defendant believed that the amount of force which he used or threatened to use was necessary to prevent or terminate the interference and that his belief was reasonable. You as jurors will end up looking 
at it from the standpoint of a 17-year-old under the circumstances as they existed on August 25th of 2020. And Mr. Binger makes a big thing out of Kyle Rittenhouse was the only person who shot somebody that evening. True. Mr. Rittenhouse was the only person who was chased by Joseph Rosenbaum that evening. This is Joseph Rosenbaum. And what's important in this photograph is one, it will allow you to identify him throughout the course of trial. Notice the belt, the baggy, lengthy jeans, and there will be a fair amount of testimony, I'm sure, regarding the maroon shirt. He's obviously currently wearing it. Mr. Rosenbaum was at a location, and Mr. Rosenbaum had along with other individuals, started a dumpster on fire. And when somebody put that dumpster that was very close to a gas station out, Mr. Rosenbaum became enraged. I'm gonna go back, does this sound on? interaction and he was upset and he's yelling that he wants to be shot and you'll see individuals in the full video which you'll see in the course of trial holding him back trying to stop him from getting at an individual who is dressed with a baseball cap an AR rifle and long pants excuse me short pants who looks very much like Kyle Rittenhouse. Here's Mr. Rosenbaum in, during the evening. Him and his friend or associate, Joshua Zeminski, had just come from starting a trailer on fire. He arms himself with a chain and goes up and down Sheridan Road, carrying this rather heavy chain used to tie down equipment. Next is a still photograph taken from the ultimate gas station. Him, Joshua Zeminski. The evidence will show that Mr. Zeminski, also named as Alec Blaine, and Mr. Rosenbaum are together throughout the evening. And Joshua Zeminski plays a central role in this scenario on August 25th. One, creating chaos and havoc with Mr. Rosenbaum. And two, more importantly, when we finally get to car source number three, Mr. Zeminski is the individual who fires the first shot that evening behind Kyle Rittenhouse as he's being chased by Mr. Rosenbaum. Here's a picture with two circles, Mr. Rosenbaum and Mr. Zeminski starting the trailer on fire on Sheridan Road along with a dumpster. You see the photograph, the second one circled. The testimony will show that that is in fact Mr. Rosenbaum wearing a blue mask, not his shirt over his head and carrying a bag, which I'm sure there will be much testimony about. Other individuals in this, once again, Mr. Zeminski. In the photograph taken at the ultimate, this is a still from one of the videos you'll get to see, is Mr. Zeminski armed with the weapon that he ultimately fires at the car source three. The individual with the red hair is Kelly Zeminski. She has a backpack and there's a circle on her hand with a big heavy flashlight. As you can see, there was no need that evening for a flashlight other than it being a weapon. Count two is an individual by the name of Richard McGinnis. He was a reporter 
covering the riots in Kenosha. He had covered the riots in Portland, Minneapolis. And he will tell you, when he's called to the witness stand by either the state or myself, that he was dressed like this that night. The black t-shirt with the black, the helmet on his head. And he had interviewed Kyle Rittenhouse and talked to him. And Mr. Balch and Rittenhouse were going to go out and see if anybody needed medical attention that evening. And Richie McGinnis was going to follow along. He will testify that he goes out with them and eventually they have an interaction with the individual who we refer to as Yellow Pants Man. This is Gage Grosquitz, the individual who is the victim, or excuse me, the complaining witness in count five, I apologize. And in that photograph, you see that he's wearing a backpack and he has his cell phone in his hand as he does throughout the evening filming. Photograph 10, excuse me, the next photograph, is the evidence will show Gage Grosquitz running down Sheridan Road and you see his hand going into the back of his waistband pulling out a firearm to arm himself. The evidence will show through testimony of an individual by the name of Nathan DeBruyne that that yellow dot right up there is where Kyle Rittenhouse is as they chase him down Sheridan Road. Mr. Grosquitz is not in any danger. Kyle Rittenhouse has already told him that he's going to turn himself into the police, yet he arms and continues with the mob to attack. This is a picture of Anthony Huber, the individual who attacks my client as he's laying on the ground after being kicked in the head by Jump Kick Man with his skateboard. He hit him with the skateboard as he was running down Sheridan Road, and then as he's laying prone on the ground, he comes in for another hit on his head and then grabs Kyle Rittenhouse's firearm to try and take it away from him. The next photograph is a picture to look at the whole skateboard, the size of that skateboard, the trucks of that skateboard. Ladies and gentlemen, I would love to be able to hold up that skateboard in front of you as evidence today, because then you could see it. You could see the weight and the heft of what a skateboard is. And what that skateboard would do is somebody takes it in their hand and swings down on somebody's shoulder, head, and neck, trying to separate the head from the body, as Mr. Huber did. But Your Honor, I'm going to object to the argument here, Your Honor. This is this is straying beyond a characterization of the evidence, and it's Mr. Richard's interpretation as an argument. You'll see the photographs, you'll see the videos, and ultimately you'll get to make the decision of what Anthony Huber was trying to do. The skateboard doesn't exist because Ms. Giddings, his girlfriend, in spite of repeated requests by Detective Howard, refused to produce it. That's what the evidence will show. Mr. Huber at the ultimate gas holding back Mr. Rosenbaum, who is ultimately the individual who lit the fuse that night. Man I refer to as jump kick man or the non-complaining witness. Kyle is laying on the ground after being knocked to the ground by an individual hitting him in the head of the rock, Anthony Huber hitting him with the skateboard, and jump kick man comes in, kicks him square in the face with his black boot, close-ups of that. And as he's kicking him in the face, Kyle fires two shots at that individual. He's not hit. He gets up and he runs away into the night, never to be seen again, never coming forward to identify himself as a victim, complaining witness or otherwise to law enforcement. We looked for him, the evidence will show. The state looked for him, the evidence will show. Those are the big players 
in this case. But ultimately, what you'll end up having to decide, looking at all the circumstances of that evening, are the events that occurred over really a brief 15-minute period, but more importantly, three minutes. The police spread or push people south to approximately 60th. That's something we can agree. There's no line set up to stop Kyle or anybody else going in a southerly direction down Sheridan Road. There's no statement that if you go in that direction, you can't come back if you have business in that direction. Kyle, an individual by the name of Ryan Balch, followed by Richard McGinnis, go down there, Sheridan Road. And at 11.40, they have a conversation yelling medic. And you'll see the videotape of this event. Kyle's got his medical bag, his gun, and he comes upon these three individuals. And the individual in the yellow pants accuses Kyle Rittenhouse of pointing a laser sight from a gun at him. Kyle shrugs it off, does not want confrontation with these individuals, does not point his firearm at them, and he leaves. Why does he leave? Because he doesn't want trouble. These are the three individuals who are with Yellow Pants. One individual is carrying a noose. I don't know what that's for. The other individual, the testimony will be from Kyle Rittenhouse and Richie McGinnis, had rocks in his hands. And then the blue-shirted individual was carrying a 9 millimeter firearm. Richard McGinnis will tell you about the marauding nature of these individuals. He was so intimidated by them after Kyle walked away that he had to give up two white claws to him to settle him down and some cigarettes so that he would be able to leave them. Kyle, from there, realizes he's been separated from Mr. Balch. He goes over to the ultimate gas station looking for Mr. Balch and is unable to find him. What happens next is he attempts to get back to car source at 59th and Sheridan Road. This is Kyle on the right coming into the frame. They don't let him pass. He goes back to the ultimate gas station, and a few minutes later, at approximately 11.45, he receives a phone call from Dominic Black. Dominic Black informs him, the evidence will show, that they're breaking windows and starting fires down at Car Source 3. Go and stop them. He asks an individual for a fire extinguisher and asks the individual to go down to car source three with him. The individual gives him the fire extinguisher, but does not go with him. And Kyle heads down to car source three. He doesn't know that Mr. Rosenbaum is down there. He's been asked to go down there by Nick Smith. He heads down Sheridan from 60th, walking to Sheridan and 63rd where the car source is. That's a picture of him from a video leaving the car source at 11.46 p.m. approximately. He has his firearm, and he has, as you can see in his other hand, a fire extinguisher to put out the, picture, the fires and, that are being started down there. This is an aerial photograph that the state had referred to in its opening, and it's actually started to roll and you'll see circles in here. There's Kelly Zeminski in the green um, lettering, and that's a thermal energy and image, excuse me. I don't 
don't think I get started. It starts very slowly. You could they people are labeled Richard McGinnis, Richie McGinnis, and they head down. You see Mr. Rosenbaum come around from hiding in the cars, beginning to chase my client. You'll see the flash of the firearm from Mr. Zabinski, and you'll see the flashes of his first shots. I am not responsible for cutting this video. I don't know how it got the way it did chopped up. That's the FBI up in the plane that took this video. But it's very telling because you'll see this a hundred times. I'm not going to go through it again for you in opening, but you'll see it that the individuals are heading down Sheridan Road and you'll see this Mr. McGinnis is now over here go and hide right in this location. You'll see Kyle come into this area and pause where Mr. and Mrs. Zeminski are, and you'll see in this car is a fire that started. You'll see how it's bright. And they go, Kyle runs in this direction, trying to get away from Mr. Rosenbaum. Ladies and gentlemen, Kyle Rittenhouse is under no obligation whatsoever to retreat from Mr. Rosenbaum. He does. He runs away from him because he doesn't want a confrontation. He doesn't want trouble, which makes no sense with what the state says about him hunting or chasing him down. He's trying to get away from the individual. You'll hear testimony, not just from Kyle Rittenhouse, but Balch, Mr. Balch, about Joseph Rosenbaum stating to Kyle and to Ryan Balch in each other's presence, if I get either of you two alone, I'm going to kill you. Flat out threats to murder. When Mr. Rosenbaum is shot in the car source lot three, there's been a gunshot behind Kyle. He turns to address Mr. Rosenbaum with his firearm. Mr. Rosenbaum is not deterred he continues to run. And you'll see that on numerous videos, closing the distance. Mr. Rosenbaum could have stopped at any time. Mr. Rosenbaum is wearing that maroon shirt on his face as a mask, covering up his identity because he wants to steal my client's firearm and use it against him to carry out the threat he had made earlier. That isn't just the word of Kyle Rittenhouse made up after the fact. You'll hear the testimony of Richie McGinnis, who was close that evening. He was following behind him. You'll see him on the video. He'll testify to you in court. He did not feel endangered. He was doing his job. He will testify that Joseph Rosenbaum let out as he put it, one of the scariest screams I ever heard. Kyle Rittenhouse fires. He fires four shots at Joseph Rosenbaum. The state wishes to slow everything down into a microsecond. Those Four shots, the evidence will show, took 0.76 of a second, 76 hundredths of a second from first shot to last shot. Those shots will be put, those measurements will be put forth by Dr. John Black, who's a certified video examiner. He breaks every frame down he knows how much each frame takes. He counts the frames, and he comes up with that time.
Next photograph, 1148. That's car source three. You see an individual right here with his hand in the air. The evidence will show that's Mr. Zeminski. This is Mr. Rosenbaum in full stride running after Kyle Rittenhouse. This is a still from a video. And you'll see a lot of videos leading up to this. You'll see a video, I believe it's from Corey Elijah, where he's confronted by Mr. Rosenbaum. And he doesn't want a confrontation. And he goes, you'll hear it on the video. The video is not showing that confrontation. But you hear Kyle's voice. And he goes, friendly, friendly, friendly. He thinks, because he's giving medical attention and helping people out, that people don't have an animosity against him. He's wrong, but that's the belief in his head, and Mr. Rosenbaum chases after him. And I believe that the state will want to say, why did he go down there? He went down there because Nick Smith asked him to. Why didn't he keep running? One, you don't have to run, but two, I'll show you a video from 63rd looking back onto the car source lot taken by an individual who will testify and his daughter. Next photograph, circled again, Zeminski with the arm up, Rosenbaum in full stride chasing and an arrow pointing to Kyle. This is the video from 63rd and Sheridan Road. You'll see that whole video during the trial. The individuals were at car source, the rioters, destroying all of those vehicles. And as Kyle was running from Mr. Rosenbaum, he did not want to run into those rioters who were destroying all of that property that did not belong to them. You hear the first gunshot, the evidence will show Mr. Zeminski. You hear four shots in quick succession. The evidence will show that is Kyle firing at Mr. Rosenbaum as he's trying to take Kyle's weapon from him to use against him. You hear three more shots in quick succession. I don't think the government will have any dispute. I don't think the evidence will dispute. Those three shots are from another person who's in the car source lot firing for some reason. He was never identified, never arrested. This will show Kyle running back to the scene of the shooting. And it will show, I think the evidence will show, why Kyle Rittenhouse didn't stay and render aid for Mr. Rosenbaum. Not that he's under any obligation to do that, but sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. <laughs> The individuals who are yelling, he just shot him, shoot him, and you can see one of them with a gun, Mr. and Mrs. Zeminski. He begins running down Sheridan Road. He's not taking his gun. He's not threatening anyone as he's running down Sheridan Road. He's running in a southerly, excuse me, I always get my directions confused, a northerly direction from 63rd towards 60th. What? is at 60th. The evidence will show that is where law enforcement is, and that's where somebody would run to be protected from a mob that wants to kill him. The evidence will show this next video taken from Gage Grosquitz. 
He runs up to Kyle. At this point, he is unarmed. Kyle does not point a firearm at him, does not do anything to dissuade him from approaching him. You'll hear on the video the exchange, and you'll see it. Hey, what are you doing? You shot somebody? Who shot? Who shot? Hey, stop him! You see him running with the gun at the ground away from Mr. Grosquitz. Mr. Grosquitz came up on Kyle, got very close. Did Kyle point a firearm at him? Did Kyle shoot at him? No. All he wanted to do was get to the police. But the mob is closing in, of which Mr. Grosquitz is a member. The first individual runs up behind Kyle and hits him in the head with his hand or a hand with a rock in it. This yellow circle shows Kyle being knocked a bit askew, but more importantly, his hat being knocked off. He's run all this distance, his hat stayed on his head. The government doesn't want anyone to think that he's being attacked or hit. This still photograph shows that his hat is being knocked off. That's the first blow to Mr. Rittenhouse. He continues to run. The testimony will show that these individuals are running up on him. What's important in this photograph, the evidence will see, show, is on the left, the testimony will be that Mr. Huber is picking up his skateboard. Why is his skateboard on the ground? Because he has taken his skateboard and swung it at Kyle Rittenhouse's head for the first time, hitting him in the head. And you can see in the blue circle, Kyle Rittenhouse beginning to fall down. The two red marks are one, the individual who struck him first, and jump kick man closing in. Kyle goes to the ground. This is a still photo from a video you'll see. What's important here, the evidence will show, it's an individual. Kyle's on the ground within two feet. Kyle points the firearm at him, does not fire. The individual backs up. He's no longer a threat. Kyle does not discharge his firearm. The next picture, the unidentified complaining witness, jump kick man, kicking Kyle in the face. Behind jump kick man is Huber. Now he's picked up his skateboard. This is a photograph from a different angle, a different individual. And you see him running in Kyle's direction. There's the boot right before contact. Those are the boots that struck Kyle Rittenhouse in the face. Here is the photograph. Mr. Huber's bare hand on the skateboard, holding the trucks, bringing it into contact with the back of Kyle Rittenhouse's head. Jump kick man still has not even gotten completely on the ground. And where is Mr. Huber's hand? And it's important here, ladies and gentlemen, it's a bare hand grabbing his gun. The state will produce evidence, I believe, that there's no DNA on the gun. He must not have touched it. Ladies and gentlemen, there's video photographic evidence of him touching the gun. Next, the bare hand pulling the gun towards him. Jump kick man getting up to run away. You can see a close up, the bare hand on the gun. Kyle Rittenhouse flat on his back in the most vulnerable position one can be in. There, the strap is pulled tight. Mr. Huber's trying to pull the gun away from Kyle Rittenhouse as he's laying flat on his back. Kyle's afraid he's going to be disarmed and shot with his own weapon, the evidence will show. He fires one shot, striking Mr. Huber. In this photograph, just entering from the right, the evidence will show is Gage Grossquitz. One hand, a phone, one hand, a firearm. Here's Gage Grossquitz with his hands up, Kyle Rittenhouse 
does not fire. Look at the distance between them. Huber skateboard has not even hit the ground yet. That's how fast all these things occur. Mr. Grosquitz does not stay in that position or back up. He moves in on Kyle, getting closer, pointing the gun almost directly at his head. As the state said, he's like this, but look at where the gun is going. The gun is in the circle. It hasn't got directly to pointing at Kyle's head, but it's going there. Kyle fires once, hitting him. Another individual approaches after Gage Grosquitz has been shot, puts his hands up. Kyle Rittenhouse does nothing. In that events, in event number two, the whole event from first shot with Mr. Grosquitz, excuse me, jump kick man coming in and getting the two shots to the time Gage Grosquitz is shot in the arm is about five seconds. You'll have exact times of those shots, how fast it occurs. And after the shooting that evening, Mr. Grosquitz was interviewed. He told law enforcement his story of that evening. The one interesting detail he forgot to mention was that he was armed when he got shot. He told the police that he had lost his gun as he was running down Sheridan Avenue. He didn't know that there were people out there like him videotaping and photographing everything. He had a gun in his hand, and that's why he shot. His statement says that the reason he went into the fray was because he had to stop Anthony Huber from beating Kyle with the skateboard. At 11.51, Kyle has gotten up. There are individuals around who are in that area who've come at him. He's pointed his firearm, backed them off, and he continu continues in a northerly direction down Sheridan Road to 60th. see Kyle with his hands up approach the police car to turn himself in. The evidence will show that the police told him to get away from the car and go home. The police say that they pepper sprayed Kyle. Kyle didn't get hit with the pepper spray. He's not disputing that they might have shot pepper spray at him. That's why he backed up so quickly. He finally makes his way to car source 2 back at 59th meets up with Dominic Black, the individual who sent him down to Car Source 3, tells him about what had happened. Dominic Black, I believe, will testify that he saw him. He was white as a ghost, sweating like a pig, and he was explaining what happened, saying he had to do it. It was self-defense. They talk about going home to Antioch. Dominic Black takes him home. They leave about 10 to 12, and at 1.20, Kyle Rittenhouse and his mother are walking into the Antioch Police Department, turning themselves in to the police, which is what he wanted to do here in Kenosha, but the way Kenosha was that night, with the police department surrounded by fence and things like that, he couldn't. He turned himself into law enforcement. 
He said from that day what he did. He's made no bones about that. He acted in self-defense, ladies and gentlemen. The evidence will show that his actions on August 25th of 2020 were reasonable under the circumstances as they existed that night being attacked by Mr. Rosenbaum. The evidence will show, and the law is clear, he didn't endanger those other individuals. The government can refer to him all they wish as an active shooter. The only person he had shot was Joseph Rosenbaum, who had made threats to kill, had made numerous statements about ripping people's hearts out. He wasn't afraid to go back to jail. And Nathan DeBruyne will testify to some of the actions of Mr. Rosenbaum that night. And he'll testify, and it was one of the more telling statements, I thought, in a statement. If there was trouble that night, Joseph Rosenbaum was there. And that's ultimately who visited himself upon Kyle Rittenhouse. The evidence will show he thought, probably, that he could get that gun from Kyle Rittenhouse. He was wrong. Kyle Rittenhouse protected himself, protected his firearm so it couldn't be taken, used against him or other people from Mr. Rosenbaum who'd made threats to kill, and the other individuals who didn't see that shooting attacked him in the street like an animal. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what the evidence will show. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Uh, Richards. Let's break for lunch, folks. Um, I'm going to take a vote now, and I don't want to I don't want to influence by um, phrasing it one way or another. Are you comfortable with the temperature here? I'm going to ask how many think it's too warm, just right, or too cool. Um, so how many think it is too warm in here? Uh, how many uh, think it is just right in here? Two, four, six. Pretty much everybody. Uh, how many think it's cold in here? All right. Well, uh, the majority is going to rule, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, but uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, we have this uh, blower up here, which uh, on occasion I've uh, I, well, I used to, and it's gotten progressively worse over the years uh, in terms of its enormity and uh, intensity, uh, and uh, uh, but it controls the entire building. So I can't shut it. I can't ask them to shut it down because it uh, has control over the water, the air throughout the entire building, and it's tied into what they did to the ceiling here uh, in 1965 or so. Uh, all right. With that, uh, please don't talk about the case during the break. Uh, and uh, is it unrealistic to set a tentative start time of about quarter after one? But if you folks want more. Um, that's okay. Just let it, let me know uh, if you want more time, uh, and then we'll use this as a trial for the future. Uh, if you decide you wanted to go less time too, we could do that. But um, right now we'll aim for uh, one uh, fifteen. And uh, any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. There you heard his honor. The Honorable Bruce Schrader is the presiding judge in this case against defendant Kyle. Rittenhouse. There you have it. Opening statements are in from both sides. We're going to squeeze in a quick break and then unpack everything we just heard from the defense next here on Court TV Live.